agenda. So as I am looking at things here, uh, I'm hoping we can make a couple of changes. One is, um, Cameron, how do you feel about moving the COVID update to the end? Is that okay? Okay. Uh, and then um, I think that uh, I think that might be it actually uh, in terms of the order. Um, so that's any, any other suggested changes here, team? Not for me. Okay. All right. So without objection, we'll consider the agenda approved. And so on to um, general business and appearances. So this is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on a topic that is otherwise not on our agenda. Uh, so if you're here to talk about a specific item, please do uh, hold your comments till that item if it's um, on tonight's agenda. Um, but if you have something else you'd like to bring up, now's the time to do it. And if you would uh, say your name and where you live and uh, try to keep your comments to two minutes uh, or less, that would be fabulous. And that, generally speaking, goes for other comments um, for the remainder of the evening. Um, so that, I think that's all the preamble I need to do about that. Uh, is, would anyone like to uh, address the council? And for this, um, you know, looking at Cameron to say, hey, there's somebody, or you can you can wave, or you can unmute yourself. And um, uh, Cameron, yes. Nope, just gonna tell everyone, uh, raise your hand feature. If you go to the bottom of your screen, or if you want to draw up a reaction, um, or if you want to physically wave your hands so I can see you, if you'd like to speak. Okay, is there uh, anyone who would like to address the council? Okay, um, and just confirming, Cameron, you don't have anybody that you're seeing. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right, fair enough. Um, thank you. So we're going to uh, move on. So the first thing here, <laughs> or the next thing, is the consent agenda. Is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? I move the consent agenda. Second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion about this? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, uh, no opposed, so the consent agenda passes. Um, all right, so moving on, we have um, street closure slash painting request uh, that um, looks a, a little familiar here. Um, and uh, uh, actually for this, um, so just uh, one thought, I, uh, I'm sure there's probably some folks who would like to comment on that. That's, um, or actually, is Erica Reddick on the call? I don't see uh, Erica. Um, so for this, just to introduce this, I, I wonder, Bill, if I can turn this over to you because it would it would appear as though you know last um, or one of our previous meetings uh, we uh, created a street painting policy, and so well, it, there might be a question about like why are we considering this now? Uh, and so uh, to answer that question, I am going to turn it over to Bill, if, if that's okay. Hi. Um... And I tried to provide you some clarification uh, in writing last night, which we added to the meeting documents, which I did send to Ms. Reddick last night. Um, so we've had, you know, this is a new policy in, in years past. We've, for a long time, we've had street closure applications, and uh, the, this actually came in as a as an application. The prior one came in as an application to close the street for the purpose of street of painting uh, this justice for all with a flag on the street. And that's the way it was heard on July 7 and, and not, you know, and denied by the city council. Uh, we got the identical application for uh, Labor Day. But taking a look at the rules and regulations as well as our policy, um, because the council has said that, and, and I think appropriately that, any street painting is actually the action of the city. Even if somebody else does it for the city, it is the city's choice to do that. It is an application in the same way that somebody might want to put something in a park 
or build something in a park and we might say yes you may put that in our city park uh, but it's and you'll do it but it's still the city accepting the responsibility for that as opposed to someone having some sort of public right to install things in parks without the city's permission so because of that, we, the city can close its street anytime it wants. Uh, I mean, obviously we would wanna be good neighbors and provide notice and warning and all that stuff, but we close streets all the time for construction, for water leaks, for emergencies, uh, for any other thing that we see fit. And so there's no reason why the city can't close a street for the, you know, and we close it for street painting, even for line scraping or, or parking lot spaces or at least partial street closing. So, um, you know, I think, I think, um, so, so basically the conclusion is we don't need a street closure application for any street painting. If the street painting's been approved by the city, then the city can close the street when it sees fit and, and we can decide how much notice is necessary, et cetera. So the group here applied for street closure, I think in good faith, thinking they were applying for street painting. I don't, and so I don't think they should be dismissed on that matter, but I don't think you need to consider the street closure unless the group or the applicant, I guess just it really just come in and when name wants to have an event or something that would follow our street closure policy. So they'd be welcome to amend their request. So my advice to you is you don't need to take up the street closure. I do think, so then we turn to the street painting and, the, and uh, they did submit this application before the street policy was enacted uh, and so therefore you know I don't think we can just say well they didn't do it the right way but it, it does mean that they have to follow our policy that and I, I, I'm going to the end of my memo but I, I think it's very clear there's no vested rights with uh, something like this this is the ability to do something on city property this isn't like a right to do something on your own property where you're seeking you know, you applied under one set of zoning and now it's going to change and you still have rights under the old rule. Um, this is saying if you want to paint something on the side of City Hall, this is how you do it. And so we've said that. Furthermore, I mean, if they were to be considered, on, you know, pre-policy, they already were. Uh, this exact same application was considered on July 7 and turned down by the council for its reasons. So I think the fact that it came in early is, is kind of irrelevant. Um, so it, then it becomes following the policy. So then as we walk through the policy, the first step in the policy is it must have a council sponsor. Now it can certainly, under our charter, it's welcome to be on the agenda. I mean, in a perfect world, we'd have a sponsor ahead of time, but they're welcome to be on the agenda. But before it can go any further, there needs to be at least one council member that sponsors this. Again, because this is city a city action of putting paint on its own street. Um, if if there's none, then it basically concludes then. Uh, that's the end of the item. If, if there is one, then you would go and make your have your discussion and decide, does it meet our policy? Now, I've pointed out three areas that I think there might be conflicts with the policy, but there are several other things in the policy that talk about, does this represent community values and those kind of things? And I think those are really at the discretion of the council to determine, not staff. Um, but I think the, the proximity of the intersection, the fact that there's a flag and the fact that it seems to modify an existing statement of painting seem sort of technically clear that those match. Um, you know, I, th I certainly think in, in, in certainly in sort of doing things right that we, you, know, you, ought, you may want to hear from people before you reach a decision or decide whether there's a sponsor. I think you, know, you may want to hear people's points of view on this. That we are a government, but that, I think technically that's how you proceed. Okay, so I do not see uh, Erica Reddick on line here. Um, so I think at this point, I'm going to ask uh, the council if there is anyone who would like to um, sponsor uh, this painting. Okay, I'm not seeing anyone. Um, so um, I'm going to assume that uh, the item then um, we can basically move on since uh, there's not uh, there's not a sponsor for the 
uh, for the painting. Um, now, I, I'm guessing that there may be a few people who want to comment on that, um, and uh, so I'm going to I'm going to let folks um, comment if they like. But if you would keep your comments to two minutes or less, that would be great. And uh, yeah, so there there we are. Um, uh, if you would like to uh, make a comment about this topic, um, you can um, either raise your hand or you can do the, the hand icon um, or uh, uh, what are my other choices here, Cameron? Flagging, icon, wave, I think that's, or uh, on, oh, on mute. Okay. okay, so um, the name I, I see here is uh, Jeffrey Flanders. Um, is would you like to speak? Uh, I'll I'll give the um, I'll give it over to Don Marie who who seemed to be before me. This okay. is Alice. You've heard from me before. Yes. I'm going to pass it over to Alice. Uh, okay. To Don Marie, if you will. Oh, uh, that is fine. Okay, Don Marie, go ahead. This is Jeff. Oh, and also if you would if you'd say your your last name where you live. Yes, my name is Don Marie Tomasi. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, Alice, thank you very much, darling. I'd love to see you as usual. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I was concerned as to when the council decided to make it a point that you needed a sponsor. At what date? I was interested in that. And also, um, who brought forth that? ID ideology and who I'm assuming you all agreed with it, but I was just curious as to who brought it forth on that date. Also, um, you did mention that um, you were concerned with the unity message, and I find it hard to believe that you know the last line of our oath, you know, liberty and justice for all could possibly can be construed as something other than what it exactly is. Um, that's what we're looking for is unity and you know, promoting it as, as Americans as a whole. And I'm hoping people see that from us and uh, not put something else forth upon us. Um, we want us to get along with our neighbors and our neighbors to get along with us. And that is part of the reason why we thought this was a good idea to bring forth again. So thank you. Oh, Dom Marie Tomasi. And, and where are you, did you say where you're from again? I forget. I'm from Barrytown and I'm actually, okay. actually running for Washington County Senate seat. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, Alice, do you wanna speak? Um, you're muted though. While we're waiting for her to unmute, I will answer Ms. Tanasi's question. The council passed the policy on August 12th. Uh, it was duly warned. It was drafted after a discussion with the council. And um, so it was brought forth as a, as a committee of the whole. And that included the sponsorship. So it should be in with the notes in, of the meeting. All right, go ahead, Alice. Okay, I'm really disappointed that the council as a body decided to change the rules uh, concerning the street painting since the first one that was there uh, did not come under those same rules. I'm, it reminds me of, to be very honest, and I'm not pulling a race card, but it reminds me of separate but equal. From my last speaking to you all, you all know that I was born during the civil rights movement. And I was there when Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated and the whole story. I recall from my father how he was a freedom writer and went into Mississippi with a couple of white men to help people register to vote. I remember how difficult it was for certain people of color, black people, to vote across the United States because they came under different rules than did uh, others who were not uh, pigmented in the same way. I am very, very disappointed that the message that underlies our Constitution, liberty and justice for all, is considered hate speech or negative in any kind of way. You would have to convince me 
that this was not meant to further uh, a political agenda of a group that may not be uh, construed as embracing liberty and justice for all, but perhaps liberty and justice for some. And I'd like to comment that this group Black Lives Matter, even though there are many people of color in it, are also um, many of them white youths who haven't a clue what civil rights is all about, except what they've gotten through their agendas uh, from their schools. I would like to see liberty and justice for all painted on the streets as a mural in Montpelier, just as Black Lives Matter, because all lives matter. You will be held, history will hold us accountable for this moment. I'm, I'm going to interrupt you here, Alice, because you're um, over two minutes or so now. So if you have any final thoughts there. Okay. Is there, is there not even one among the Montpelier Council who would be willing to at least entertain the thought that Black Lives Matter is legitimate, but so is liberty and justice for all? Is there not one among the, the august body? And that's what I would have to say. And Alice, uh, what is your last name and where do you live? My last name is Flanders. I'm using Jeff's computer. Okay. I'm the, okay, I'm in uh, White River Junction. I'm actually running for uh, Windsor 4-2. And uh, by the way, yes, Flanders, you know that name. Senator Ralph Flanders from Vermont who stood on long, alone on the, on the Senate floor against uh, Joe McCarthy was my husband's grandfather. Great, thank you very much. Um, Cameron, do we have anyone else? Um, I just want to note that Erica Reddick is on the call now, if you'd like. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, at this point, I'm, go I'm just going to go in the order that I, I see folks. So I saw um, Lynn Dyke and then uh, Brock uh, Coder. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your names. Um, Lynn, go ahead. Okay, well, first of all, I want to say that I am very proud to be an American. And I like liberty and justice for all. And I like the fact that all lives matter. It is not hate speech to me. And I don't know how it ever became hate speech. I went to the rally to support the police, and that was horrible. And the, what, the impression I get of the Black Lives Matter movement personally is I saw it with my own eyes, and some of the signs that were there and held up were not good ones, but you didn't see that on the news at all. But I did have a conversation with people, conversations, and I did have a conversation with a reporter. And what I told her is that we should all be Americans and we need a softer side of this. And uh, just putting that on there, Black Lives Matter, what about us that are not? And what about them who would like to see liberty and justice for all? I mean, I think the Black Lives Matter movement has been hijacked. It's not what it started out to be. And I think we need to get unity back and get some common sense back. Liberty and justice for all, those are not bad words and that is not hate speech. And I, I, I am willing to fight to the end to defend that. I'm also running for the house, um, Addison 4. I live in Bristol. Sorry, I was muted just now. Thank you, Lynn. Um, Brock, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate you actually saying my name properly. You might be the first person ever, <laughs> so well done. <laughs> Um, Barack Odair, running for uh, state representative, the House of Representatives out of Washington Chittenden District, actually out of Waterbury Center. Um, I'm merely just here to be a fly on the wall and see how things are going and how this meeting will end up. But honestly, I'm just here to say I was kind of alarmed that 
our local government was capable morally of allowing to allowing one group political movement or or anything to receive special treatment over anybody else i understand the message behind it i truly think it's a noble cause but at the same time to disallow another group to say something is showing preference and that's technically not acceptable as far as i'm concerned and that's honestly that's all i really have to say i was just kind of disappointed in my local government I think that unity is key at this point. I just drove all the way out to Colorado to see my family and everybody I've been interviewing just wants things back to the way they were. They want to put that work in and, and reinstill the faith that people have in their fellow Americans. I think showing them the constitution, how everybody is protected by that, that good piece of paper is, is a great way to do it. And, and I think that we should, try to look for more than one person on the council, maybe half of you folks, yes or no. I don't really, really see any reason why red, white, and blue should be considered offensive these days. And that's all I have to say, thank you. Um, sorry, thank you. Um, uh, uh, I'm seeing Sean Stevens on, and then uh, Erica, if you wanna make a comment, you may. Go ahead, Sean. Hi, folks. Thank you. I'll be super short because I actually came to comment on something later in the agenda. I just want to hop on and say I do support the decision you guys have made. Contrary to what the last few people have said, I think putting Black Lives Matter unequivocally and without dilution by other messages is super strong, super powerful, and super right. You did the right thing. And if everybody thought it was super important to put liberty and justice for all painted on the street, why didn't they want to do that before the Black Lives Matter got painted on the street? It is becoming a big deal for a lot of people right now because they intend to dilute the Black Lives Matter message and to try to draw the spotlight away from that message. Um, I disagree with that, and I think you guys did the right thing, and I appreciate it. Thank you, Sean. Did you say where you live? Yeah, my apologies. I live right here in Montpelier. Okay, thank you. Um, Erica, and then Samantha, did you have your hand raised? Okay, go ahead. Thank you. I apologize uh, for being late to the meeting. Um, I would just like to say thank you for actually giving us the opportunity to be heard um, I was very discouraged by the email that I received from uh, Mr. Frazier saying that you guys could just dismiss us uh, because we've already submitted the same application and it's already been dismissed because John Clark is a racist. And so the idea that we still get to come and uh, be heard is very important because while the sentiment of Black Lives Matter is one that everyone can agree with and get behind, uh, as the wife of a black man, uh, as half my family is Mexican and, you know, more, more of my family is not white than they are white, we can all agree that that message is important and that these conversations need to be had. But as far as diluting the message, I don't think with liberty and justice for all is diluting the message. I think Black Lives Matter is diluting its own message with things like all cops are B words and F the police and abolish the police and a lot of other things that the majority of Americans are not behind. And so I would just say that this is not about just Black Lives Matter and this is not just about painting on the street. It's about a governmental entity believing that it is okay to promote one political party over another. That is not okay. So however you feel about Black Lives Matter and however you feel about the Pledge of Allegiance doesn't really matter when we're talking about policy, uh, public policy, and how and in what way it's appropriate for a government to behave with its constituents, with its message, and with our money, uh, with our time. So I would just say, if it's okay for the government to do things like paint Black Lives Matter on the street, and that's okay, and that's governments, then I'm not sure why you would have anything against prayer in the school. 
and other things like that, saying the Pledge of Allegiance and doing other things that other people believe are important and meaningful and thoughtful and bring unity. So again, I'm just, I would just ask that the city council apply its logic to all circumstances rather than just the ones that are convenient for them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Samantha. I'd like to thank you all for, again, giving us this opportunity to speak. Um, my name is Samantha LaFave, and I live in Orange. I am running for a house position for Orange County District 1. Um, and I uh, am going off of um, what people before me have said and that how surprised I am that people that are supposed to be representing our capital city um, can shoot, you know, clearly show that they are choosing one side over the other to be represented and side is the wrong word um one one um you know portion gets to speak and gets to have their voice put out and then you know when we ask for something to get put out and as the gentleman that said a little bit before why was why didn't we do this before well why wasn't before there a um inter, you know a new policy about no street painting why did that have to be put in once there was already one painting you know, that's where I think we start to see the gap where it's just, just a harder line being driven. And liberty and justice for all, that means for all. And Mr. Pete, I know when you put your uniform on, you care about all of us. I know when I was an EMT, a firefighter, it, it didn't matter to me, you know, who you were, you know, what, what was happening. I cared about you and what I could do to help you. And liberty and justice for all means that we all get to have justice and liberty. For me, it didn't, doesn't matter the color of your skin, your education, your age, where you work. It matters who you are and your heart and your character. And so now we are being told that we are all racist because we are asking for liberty and justice for all to be proudly displayed just as other sayings are being proudly displayed, as they should be. And I ask each one of you that have made the decision to tell us no, to really think at home tonight about what you are saying. You all are in the position you are in because of the people around you. And I know that you are not representing what I would want my capital to say, that they would want one side more than the other or one group over another. Um, Samantha, I'm going to interrupt your uh, um, over two minutes at this point, if you have any um, final thoughts. Yeah, I'd like for you guys to think about this a little bit longer. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, I am not seeing anybody else raising a hand. Cameron, anyone? Okay. Um, we, I don't think we need to revisit this as a, a council necessarily anyone want to change their mind we heard this okay all right so we are going to move on in our agenda um, so the next thing is because we moved the COVID-19 update um, to the end the next thing is a homelessness task force and I actually um, to be fair just to put a, a cap on on the previous item I just want to say for myself I um, think we are representing the values of our community and I am um, proud that we paint, painted Black Lives Matter on the street and um, I'm glad that we are not um, bookending it with a, a different message um, so uh, all for uh, patriotism and, uh, you know, being American uh, at the same time, uh, believing that we can hold ourselves to a, a higher standard than where we're at right now um, as Americans. So, um, and that, that to me is part of what um, the message is. But anyway, that's, uh, that's sort of where I'm at. That, but we're going to move on. Um, so the next thing is uh, the homelessness task force. So they have a, uh, a request for a proposal they'd like to put out. And I thought I saw Shana on the meeting. Um, it's gonna be Ken Russell. Oh, Ken, I also saw Ken. Ken, would you like to uh, speak about this? Sure, um, thank you, Ann. Um, so what we have is um, this street outreach position that we've discussed previously. 
and we've put it in the form of an RFP um, that allow different agencies to apply for the money. Um, Cameron worked really hard on the RFP with Will Everly and other members of the committee, and we've gone through it with a fine tooth comb. And um, it's you know just over thirty three thousand. Um, you know it's the allocation that you so generously gave us, and um, so. This will allow an, an agency to apply um, to support a um, street outreach worker, a pure street outreach worker. Um, they have some; they would have some flexibility in how they administer the program. I mean, they will apply and try to be, make it most appealing. Um, and there will be a small. There will be a, there's a request that they allocate a percentage of the budget for supplies, which is an ongoing need for the folks out on the street. Um, there was some conversation about the livable wage, which of course is a, a strong value for this council. There is a little bit of flexibility in the language um, because some of the people who tend to go for these positions might be balancing other needs, um, like sometimes they're trying to keep their income and their hours worked under a certain range. So I, I know that technically if it's under $200,000, um, that that um, the livable wage does not apply, but we, with the language encourages the use of it, but also gives the applying organization some latitude to negotiate if a person applying for the job um, requests it. Some some flexibility to say keep their income under a certain thing because sometimes that that might affect other services they might be receiving. Um, it's, I mean, I, th I think we've discussed quite a bit about how important this need is for the folks out on the street, um, certainly with the uncertainty um, about what's happening with the folks in the motels. Uh, we don't fully understand what the state's plans are going to be. I'm not sure anybody does, um, you know, right, and, you know, and what the impacts of COVID, what the impacts of federal money are going to be. So um, there is a certain amount of the population that just doesn't stay indoors. Um, and so there's a, there are always folks outside. Um, and, you know, there's been movements, you know, in terms of um, the overflow shelters. There's, you know, we don't have what we used to have. So um, that's, that's kind of it. Um, in a nutshell, happy to answer any questions. Uh, thanks, Ken. I have uh, one question to start here. Is this um, a second person or is this just, I, I know we had talked about hiring somebody, um, uh, gosh, back a while ago now when we had this conversation. Is this is this that person potentially or is this a second person? This is that person. This is that person. Okay, great. Thank you. Any this other? Is what we put in the budget. Right. So this is just the RFP to, to find that person, really. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, any questions, comments from council? Uh, Donna, go ahead. Um, thank you, Ken. A very informative draft as far as your program management. My question is spending all the money on just this. There were other things in the budget you showed us, your proposed expenditures. So what's going to happen to some of those other needs if we put all the money into this avenue versus trying to get some grants to supplement it or add to it? Uh, that's a good question, Donna. I, I mean, I, I think, I mean, this has always been very much the top of our perceived priorities. This is, you know, what we felt is the most important is somebody out there meeting people, having get their needs met. Um, and, um, you know, when we were dealing with a big, big, bigger pot of money, um, some of those other things made sense. Um, but when it was winnowed down and you still were, quite generous in what we ended up with. Um, it did, I think we all felt like it's this, we felt like this created the most bang for the buck for lack of a better phrase. Um, so yes, there are other, other needs. Um, and I think we're actively looking for how to get, uh, looking for other funding sources. I mean, I think our, we've had good generosity from the community with supplies. Um, and I, I think we could, I think there's fundraising potential for this population. I think there's a lot of goodwill 
and concern for folks who are out there. Uh, that's helpful to know. I guess I still would tend to go to like 2530 and have some buffer. We seem to have emergencies that show up. So it just concerns me to spend all of it. That's yeah. all. But thank uh, you. I hear you. I hear you, Donna. Uh, Jack, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ken. Um, I uh, read the uh, the proposal, and I'm cur I have a couple of questions. One is, have have there been a, any organizations so far that have been identified or expressed uh, interest in in doing this? And two, which is a related question, is uh, would it be consistent with your uh, planning if uh, some organization were to propose to use you know, split this work between a couple of people instead of uh, an ident one identified individual, which seems to be what the proposal is talking about. Right. Um, well, I, no, I think I, I think it could work well with splitting the time. And there's been some conversation around that. Um, because it can be very taxing work and, you know, and if sometimes you're wanting 24 hour coverage. So there's definitely, this doesn't preclude that. Um, as far as organizations, yeah, I mean, and frankly, you know, we probably, I mean, there are some, some of the organizations that we're all affiliated with on the task force, there's folks who are interested in applying. So um, Rick, Rick has mentioned for Good Samaritan Haven, um, and I, I'm going to be, I am very likely going to be associated with an organization that may apply. So that is a potential conflict. And we talked about that at the, at the task force meeting on whether it was appropriate for me to um, present here. I, can, I can't disclose what organization that would be yet. Um, um, Don Little, who's on our task force, is the person who's been doing this work the whole time and would, you know, I think a lot of people would say she could very well be person hired. So um, one of the things that Rick mentioned was that, I mean, I, and I don't know who he's thinking, but he's thinking he wanted, he might, he would consider applying in, in partnership with another organization. Um, and that, and I know there's some language in there about sort of encouraging partnerships between organizations. And I know Washington County uh, Mental Health is is very interested, at least in the conversation on how this is set up. And they participated in some of these conversations in in the meeting, you know, two weeks ago or three weeks ago at this point. So you're not going into this worried that you won't have a anyone stepping up to uh, do it once you once this is released. I don't think so. No, there's, this is, I mean, I, I think everybody I've talked to sees this as a great need and, and also, and, and we try to encourage, and as you know, back to counselor Bates comments back in February, looking regionally and making sure we're working with Barry in Berlin and, and in coordination with all the different agencies with public safety with Washington County. So, I mean, so I, I think, the the need is quite clear the efficacy of this approach everyone agrees about so um and and you know and and it's the reality is there's um a lot of people are working on homeless and this is the position that actually gets people out on the street face to face with folks in the environment where they spend a lot of their time great thanks yeah. So just piggybacking on uh, Jack's question, it, it made me think of, uh, well, your answer really uh, brought this question to mind, which is that if there's a number of folks from within your, um, from the task force that either may be applying or have, um, you know, some thought about uh applying uh, or connections to applying, uh, who's actually making the decision to um, award that? Uh, Cameron, yeah. Um, sorry, I, I just mean to jump in as staff representative for this committee is we would either take as many um, committee members as we could who weren't part of the application, get them to vote, 
or um, present that to a couple ad hoc volunteers who would be interested in reviewing these RFP responses. But okay. people who had been applying or were associated with the groups they were applying would not be reviewing the RFPs. Great. It also be in city money, so you'd have to approve it. Right. Anyway. So right. you would get it. Right. Okay. I just want to make sure there was enough folks who had not recused themselves that a decision could be made. So that's that's good. Um, other questions for Ken? Uh, Lauren. Hey, thanks. I, I think this, I'm really excited to see this moving forward. I know we've been talking about it for a long time. So thank you for all the work that's gone into it. It's, it's exciting. I guess my only question is um, kind of tied to what Donna was asking like particularly knowing that there's been kind of big changes this year with COVID and how the state has stepped up and knowing that there might be, you know, unique needs this year with the pandemic still going on, like just are, are there still resources? Like is the state still stepping up? Are there still like COVID relief funds and things that are helping? Are you anticipating like that's gonna run out and we're gonna, you know, be up against a wall at some point? Just kind of curious if there's dynamics that we should be aware of um and I, I guess it gets to that like is there is there a cushion we should be building in um for you know kind of emergency needs particularly at this really hard time i appreciate the question i mean i i mean and some of it's uh there's definitely some unknown in there and i mean we'll you know we'll ask this question of will everly who's you know field director for ahs and he answers the best he can, but obviously there's decisions being made up, up the hierarchy and resources are not assured. Um, and um, I mean, there's, it's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff going on upstairs in terms of what actually trickles down. Um, so I, I think this position and having it um, built and sustained locally here is a really fantastic thing and wonderful commitment on the part of all y'all um, to quote Cameron. And I don't know if I did that right, but, um, but, but seriously, it, it, it is, it, there, there's an, there's unknown in terms of the state level. And like back in March during the you know, early COVID, we were trying to get money for hand washing stations and, and things like that. So, um, and, and the cost of putting folks up in the motels is, is quite high. Um, and who, who, I'm not sure how sustainable it is. I mean, it, the, the motel program was already, the general assistance program before was already um, the subject of financial stresses. So, Part of I think our overall thinking as a task force is is taking some responsibility here locally for this population and what's happening there and looking outside the way you know expecting there to be federal money trickling down um, and and um, and I've you know somebody just last week was saying you know the squeeze is on you know and so I mean I think yeah the you can't count on there being resources, but you will count on there being human, you know, people, you know, getting pushed out on the streets. So, um, Dan, go ahead. Yeah. Just to follow up to that, Ken, and maybe a clarification question, this position that this RFP would fill really is a, a someone to basically triage, identify, connect with, people with homeless who are, you know, uh, encountering homelessness and to assess their needs and to try and connect them to the services so that it's really going to be dependent ultimately the success of this position in some respects on what services they can connect them to, right? Right. Right. Well, and, you know, there's a certain range of services that are, that are there, but uh, housing is what's really needed and affordable housing. And, you know, that's true for a lot of Vermonters. The cost of housing has gone up that, you know, there's, there's a whole issue there. Right. I mean, there's, there's housing, there's food, there's mental health issues that are all tied into this, but I, I just wanted to be clear and just so I can understand and maybe also so the audience listening at home that we're clear that 
this is this is really about trying to come up with a uh, someone who can start to do that uh, those assessments, which I think are uh, my understanding is that that's the important first step for for these populations to start to get them because it builds first of all it, it connects them to these populations, and then secondly it also would um, you know effectively build that n understanding of what the numbers and needs are. So that if there is seeking for funding, we, we at least know what the population looks like and what their needs are. I mean, obviously the need, the big ones not being any hidden secret uh, or right. particularly complicated. Okay. Right. No, the assessment, the knowing what's actually out there is important. And it's also in connecting people to the degree that you can with existing services, as limited as they might be in some ways. But in addition, there are are people out there who are hard to reach and who, who just are vulnerable out on the street and need some have some basic needs to be met. Uh, Donna, then Connor, yeah. Um, I'd like to ask Chief Pete if he would make any comment on this worker since you'll be right, your police officers will be right there on the front line with them. Um, have you read through the report and have a comment? Um, I, I haven't had a chance to look through the report very in depth, uh, definitely, but uh, I, I do think that as far as what I think um, the department goes, um, uh, is that if we're looking at the totality of everything, um, that, that the department will make sure that it, uh, it does its best to partner with everyone um, for the benefit of everyone in the community. Um, so, so again, with, with a lot of the talk and discussions of, of which calls for service police should be responding to, um, the resources are limited for officers to point people who are in critical situations. Um, our, our resources are limited in how we can do that. Um, so, so we're just cognizant of, of, again, of mission creep and just to making sure that we don't, um, that, that if it's a service that can be handled by somebody who is better prepared um, uh, and equipped to do it, then it, it's something that we're, we're definitely totally all for. Thank you. Great. Um, Connor and then, and then Dan, we'll come back to you. Uh, Ken, first of all, thanks so much for all the work you're doing. And uh, I, I know we don't give you too much to work with and really trust that you're uh, making the best use of the resources. So really grateful for that. Um, it'd be anecdotal, but um, a lot of homeless folks I talk to can seem to split their time quite a bit, and even their days and weeks um, between Barry and Montpelier. Um, I was just wondering if you found that to be the case, you know, broader than just folks I've spoken to. And if so, how much of this needs to be a conversation between the two cities, just so there's some consistency? Um, you know, I can see value in seeing the same faces, you know. Is, is this worth a discussion with the Barry City Council at some point to maybe make this more of a full-time position, just like we're talking about with the social worker position? Absolutely. No, I, I, and, and it's, no, it's not just your, your anecdotal information bears out. Um, it's very real that, and folks will travel back and forth um, between the two cities. Um, there are different services they might access in each one or, Oftentimes it's like people need a ride to a motel down in Barry from Montpelier. Um, so yeah, it's definitely part of the same circuit. Um, we, the connection with um, Barry and, and Berlin and, you know, regionally is, is, is very important. And I think most of the people we work with well understand it and have seen a lot of good, um, you know, we, we, you know, we get, we've had conversations you know, with folks in Barry and with us, there's, there's good, or, you know, there's, you know, there's good folks working and we do our best to network, but yeah, any council to council uh, connection on this is great. We did, um, Erica rail who's on our council is on our task force is on Barry city council. And so she's, she's, she's talked to them about this, this work. Um, you know, they, they have Brooke Pouillot, who's, who's on, you know, on their force and we, you know, we, we have meetings together and, and sometimes the meetings are just like what's going on out there. And that's, you know, and sometimes just that, that basic real time information is really important. And sometimes like, 
again, like Rick DeAngelis, head of Good Samaritan Haven. Well, you know, he's running busy trying to keep it all together. And sometimes those meetings are good opportunities for him, for like, say, Tim Bombardier to understand from him what's going on or, or now Chief Pete or, you know, you know, like just trading information every which way makes great sense. Um, and, you know, and there's there's different approaches and there's different things we can learn from each other, too. So. Great, Dan. So I just had a, a follow up to Don and Connor's question, Chief Pete. Um, so it, it sounds like this position can be helpful to you as essentially another resource for these type of situations that it's not after a first responder type of situation to sort of hand off. It, is the way the position is drawn up um, something that will help that you'll be able to work with or were there, would there be any sort of changes or requirements to the position that you, you'd want to see um, that would be helpful in interfacing with your department? Uh, for us, sir, I, I think that um, it's it's one of those things that uh, we can plan as best as we possibly can, and we won't know what those gaps are until we have something in place. But um, as far as this department um, and how we will uh, uh, move forward, it, it's totally uh, community partnerships and goal oriented, and it, and it's 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 we're all on board with the sharing of information and doing everything that we can to. Um, help because that is that's the underscore of what, what it is we're here to do right well it also strikes me that you know this is an, another resource so that if there is you know if there is an encounter with a a, a homeless person that is in a more remote area or or such that you know you would have this uh this person to con you know to ben, essentially bring into the conversation to connect with and that would be you know, an item off of your plate to have to deal with that they could, they could deal with that. And I, I would just want that to be something that sounds like it, it is. At, and I just wanted to make sure that it was, but it sounds like it, it might be another resource in your, your toolbox um, or, or the city's toolbox, but yours in particular, if, if uh, when your first responders does encounter this type of situation and can bring this person in. Yes, sir. I, I would definitely uh, agree with that. And, and, and with that premise, I probably would also, uh, if reg in regards to um, how the, the position is currently looked at, how it's written, I'd probably have to talk with Gary and Susan Lemire, who is our new embedded social worker. Um, they're in on this call um, as well and, and talk with them about how they think that a, a good fit for it might be um, or, or how we're going to utilize it. But I'm, I am pretty very confident that um, it, it's going to be a total team effort. And like you had mentioned, it's another resource that all of us can go to um, to to free up law enforcement. So law enforcement can, can concentrate on law enforcement and social services can concentrate on the things that they do best. Thanks. Yes. Can I respond? I, I just I, I just want to underscore that very much the thinking and I, and I think it will bear out that this really will will do just that will take address some of the issues that, that need addressing and take pressure off law enforcement and supplement it. Um, and it, it, I've seen it again and again. So, you know, I, I, I think it, I, I think you'll find that it's a it, it really will it'd be a win win for us. So Great. So um, not seeing any anybody raising hands further here. So uh, is uh, this is something that you all need a motion on. Is that right? Uh, um, Madam Mayor, Mr. Mayor, Madam Mayor, I'd like to speak on this. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, uh, is that Stephen? It is. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Stephen. So, I mean, as much as I applaud the work that Don does, I think that this is so much talk and really bordering on self-delusion. Don has no resources to work with, even if she has a, a, a wage. The fact that, you know, daily, I'm, I'm calling Don three or four times a week to try to find a tent for somebody or a translator who can speak Indian or, you know, or find out why 211 is not helping anybody. And all Don has is a lot of, you know, reasons like, well, that's all we got. We don't have anything. Nothing works. 
So to pretend that a year and a half after we started, you know, I've been pounding on y'all for a year and a half over this issue. And to finally get a paid person to do what we're doing every day anyway is, is really absurd. When y'all can't even get a bathroom or a shower available to these folks, much less uh, a place to go and get a sleeping bag or a tent or a designated safe place to camp. I mean, the people are, are pissing in your pocket park, crapping behind your churches, and you, we can't do anything about any of that. You need a plan to position for federal funds or even for some of these remaining care funds. You need a plan more than you need just to pretend that having paying your existing outreach workers is going to change anything. You know, the, the dignity is missing. You've got policemen stealing beer from homeless people. You've got, you know, you've just got a, a, a uh, you're undermining the dignity in treating folks like they don't deserve a shower, don't deserve a place to crap. You know, but the construction workers get to use the new bus station, you know? So you know, the, the hypocrisy or the, the, the self-delusion of this conversation is really infuriating, in, you know? I wish that y'all just would take seriously that you need, and that task force should have written a plan by now so that we're prepared to ask for funds of what we would do, which buildings would be used, for what, uh, which could be ventilated for COVID, which campgrounds could be set up with COVID so trailers for smaller than you. I'm going to interrupt you here, Sam, because um, you are. you're at... I'm um, sure you are. Uh, you're a little over two minutes here. Do you have anything, uh, any further, like, final thoughts? Okay. Um, all right, I saw hands from, I thought, uh, uh, Cameron and then Jack, but I'll, I'm going to go Jack first. Also, Donna, did you have your hand up? No. Oh, okay. Uh, all right, so Jack and then Cameron. Thank you. I'm, I'm getting ready to move the wee. Uh, support this, but I notice we have the the due date seems to be the only thing that uh, only detail that hasn't been filled in yet, and so I'm wondering what uh, date we should put in. Um, so I'll, if you don't mind, Mayor, if I can answer that question. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Um, that was left blank because we didn't know if you wanted to have more conversation or what the outcome of this meeting would be, and we didn't want to put too. Um, close of a deadline, the deadline will probably be in consultation at our next homelessness task force meeting so that they can discuss it, what they feel is a fair timeline in the time of COVID. Um, you know, we do have some subject matter experts there. Um, and so I'd like to hear from them about that timeline, what they think is realistic, because it is a pretty robust RFP, um, you know, because we do want to be very careful with public funding um, that comes from the city. Um, I did want to sort of address some of the issues about supplies. Um, Ken mentioned it earlier, but I do want to sort of reemphasize, and I think it gets a little bit to Lauren and um, Donna's, uh, Council Member Lauren and Donna's um, comments, is that we do ask that a pretty large percentage of the money is spent on supplies. So not all of the money is going into uh, administration overhead for the organization or service provision, but to supplies to get those sleeping bags to get those that food to get that car ride to get the taxi because um, we don't know what's going to come up and we don't know what people will want or need so we did try to write that in or the task force did try to write that into their rfp thank you sorry may, may i say something in in, law, in in lines of what cameron had mentioned um, Go for it. having a having a, a dedicated person there to help us summarize and figure out the resources and the allocations that are needed there i think is is, is crucial uh, and shows a serious step in, in, in what the what what's trying to be accomplished and, and there are other resources that we can look at to get things like cots and things like tents and and that that are um there are other government websites that you can go to to get these these items for free um and i think that having a dedicated person there that can help identify and validate the things that that are being seen and done on ground and, and uh, trying to figure out what what the next steps are um, plays a huge role into um, into to working towards that dignity and that that respect and that help for for people who are out there and suffering. Great, thank you. 
Um, I'd just uh, to check, is there any other member of the public that would like to speak on this topic? And Cameron, you're not seeing anyone. Okay. Um, Jack, did you want to make a motion? I move that the city uh, issue the request for proposals as has been presented to us tonight with the due date to be determined by the manager or assistant city manager in consultation with the housing task force. Almost no second that. Almost. Almost no task force, sorry. Almost no second. No, okay. So uh, it's, uh, there's been a um, motion and a second. Um, any further discussion? Uh, okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so that passes. Um, thank you, uh, Ken and uh, Cameron and all the members of the Homelessness Task Force. Thanks for all your work on this and um, looking forward to uh, getting the responses back and then actually getting to hire someone. Uh, before, Bill, we go, yeah. before we go, um, we'd like to have Gary Gordon from Washington County Mental Health introduce Susan to all of us. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Gary Gordon. I'm the uh, coordinator of emergency services for Washington County Mental Health, and I have with me Susan Lemire, who is our um, police social worker. Um, she comes to us from uh, Greenfield, Massachusetts. She has a long, extensive history of, of service in our uh, human services and mental health, um, including uh, crisis work. Uh, I'm working on um, psychiatric units, working with uh, um, courts in our uh, correctional facilities, and we're excited to have her here. She has a huge learning curve, of course, because <laughs> we we do things a little differently in the North Country, but uh, she seems up to the task. Um, this is her first full job, full week on the job. Last week, she spent most of the time, um, most of her time with me, <laughs> trying to uh, get her trained and up to speed on what, how we do things here in Vermont. Um, but she seems to be uh, adapting pretty quickly. Um, I've only heard good things about her from the people who've encountered her so far. Um, and like I said, again, we're excited to have her. Um, we've been trying to do this for a long time. Our Chief Bakos was, our, was a proponent of this. Um, so was Chief Bombardier. We've had inquiries from the local state police. Um, our friends to the south at ACRS have been doing this for several years now, and they actually have seven seven clinicians embedded uh, with various police departments down um, in their area. I mean, we're hearing good news about them. Same in St. Albans uh, with, with the Northwestern Counseling Services. They have an embedded work up there we're hearing great things about. So we're really hoping that we can make an impact by having an embedded worker here to assist our law enforcement in their interactions with, with the populations of both cities. Hi everyone. <laughs> very, very honored and privileged and happy to be here. And thanks for having me be part of this meeting tonight. Absolutely. Thank, thank, uh, thank you so much for being here. And we're so delighted that you're here. Um, so looking forward to working with you. Great. Yeah. Um, all right. So, the next item is uh, the design review uh, public hearings. And so I think we'll really take this one at a time, uh, if that makes sense. Because there's two, there's, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's supposed to be two public hearings related to this. Is that right? Correct. One public hearing, though there are two topics. We can split them. It's probably the easiest way to manage them. Yeah. Okay, so the um, first one, the, so I'm going to uh, open the public hearing on uh, the, um, uh, which one, which is this one? This is the uh, changes to the uh, historic preservation, or not historic preservation, what am I saying? You know what I'm trying to say here. Design review. Design review, thank you. <laughs> right, so the changes to the design review uh, district. Um, so, officially opening that public hearing. Uh, Mike, do you want to um, say anything further about this? Uh, I gave everybody, um, yes, good evening, Mike Miller, Planning Director. 
Um, so I gave everyone a summary at the last meeting. I don't know if you want me to spend the time to go through that presentation again. I'm more than happy to, uh, if you guys are comfortable um, and want to uh, ask questions or get public comment, um, I, I'll leave it up to you which way you want me to try to move forward on that. I don't necessarily need an additional um, presentation. Um, what other thoughts from the council on that? Or from the public, I suppose. Um, uh, Jack, go ahead. Because this is the first public hearing, I don't think it needs to be extensive, but I think it might be useful to get an overview. Yeah. I think that's probably a good idea. Uh, yeah, so I'll turn it back over to you, Mike. All right. Um, so I don't know if I need to get a share screen to put the presentation up again. Otherwise, I can just run through the the we'll need to share your screen now mike okay uh, let me see if i need to so it didn't come up on my end can you guys see that on the screen now yeah. nope no okay um because i'm not getting the shared screen. Should be at the bottom, it's the green. Ah. Okay. There nope. you go. Missed one button, there we go. All right, so, um, uh, just real quick, um, what we're gonna concentrate really on, for this, on the, the first two, uh, looking at the design rules, a quick history and a review of the proposed rules and, um, Separately and related to this, there's also the review of the boundary changes. Um, we, the Planning Commission and DRC looked at both of these. So this goes back all the way to 2017 uh, when the, uh, the Planning Commission was working on the zoning and they had put together an entire uh, set of zoning to revise the design rules. It went to public hearing and uh, it, it it didn't receive a lot of po um, enough positive responses for the planning commission to move those forward. So they felt the best action would be to work with the historic preservation commission to develop some new rules. Um, and so those went to historic preservation in 2017. Um, and they reviewed a number of practices, um, uh, other regulations in Vermont towns, um, the rehabilitation standards from the National Park Service. Uh, they hired a consultant. Um, and the, it, it, it should be noted that a lot of the planning commission, historic planning commission members are full-time professionals in the field. And so we use a lot of their experience as well to help guide the drafting of these rules. And the goals were really these six overall objectives that they picked at the, at, identified at the start. Um, one was to improve the predictability and consistency of the applications um, and to improve the defensibility of decisions. These kind of go hand in hand. Uh, there were some court decisions. Our design review rules have been in effect since probably the 1970s or 80s. Um, and a lot of court decisions have come through and some important ones that really require our rules to have more guidance to it. So applicants have more of an understanding or an expectation of whether or not they can be approved. And it would help the people reviewing applications to understand um, whether, whether a project meets or doesn't meet a requirement. So um, those are really the two primary drivers of this, was trying to make sure that we had something that was legally defensible. Um, and then they talked about a number of, of technical pieces, like whether we should be a historic review district and not a design review district. And they decided to continue to be a design review district. I won't go into all the reasons why, but there's a t some good reasons why we maintained a design review. Um, we also, um, in order to meet our uh, certified local government requirements, which Montpelier is one of uh, a CLG community in the state, uh, we had to uh, be consistent with at least the National Park Service rehabilitation standards. So that was 
what was uh, selected. We also, uh, and this was a follow through from the 2018 zoning, we wanted to be more flexible with our rules and have more clear exemptions and opportunities for administrative review. This has been a very successful um, feature of the current zoning um, where rather than really being very specific about things, we try to be a little bit more flexible to allow for better, better design and better projects. And, um, and, and having administrative requirements means uh, simpler, straightforward projects don't need to go through a long, pro long process. Uh, so both of these have been very uh, successful. Uh, they wanted to continue that here in the drafting and design review. Um, and then they wanted to establish a transparent review guidelines. And it's the only thing that hasn't been done yet. And the reason why they haven't developed the guideline book is it's going to be a long, um, you know, they're going to get grants, um, a longer process with a much more detailed guide. It'll really help applicants a lot. But they didn't want to spend the money developing the guide if the city council changed some of the rules. So we really kind of need to wait till the rules are adopted and then we will develop the guidelines. Um, the core changes, as I mentioned last time, were really, uh, rather than having one set of rules that applies to all projects, they divided it into one set of rules that apply to alterations and additions to historic buildings, and then another set of rules that apply to projects that don't involve historic buildings. And so that was one, one key distinction. And then... Um, the application process was adjusted and um, administrative officer approvals were added, you know, consistent with what the goals were. And they increased exemptions from design review and clarified uh, what are called the statutory exemptions, um, which are in, in state law, which, which were really unclear in the current rules. Um, so after design review put that together, they had some public hearings they gave their public, um, they gave those documents to the planning commission and the planning commission was tasked with adjusting the boundaries. Um, the current boundary that is in our design um, overlay district is really arbitrary. It doesn't follow any national register district, historic district, zoning boundaries. It's, it's very arbitrary. And our goal was to have a boundary which had some justification. So some basic rules um, that um, because of programs, everything in the, de in the designated downtown must be in the um, design overlay district. That's part of that program's requirements. Um, under state law, the capital complex cannot be in the design review. Uh, and the planning commission decided they would match them to neighborhood boundaries to the best that they could, and they had to make some exceptions. Um, but the focus was really on the downtowns and the gateways. And where we ended up, um, mostly the same as today. We didn't make a lot of drastic changes. You'll see changes mostly at the edges. We did keep uh, the VCF, VCFA parcel in but we removed the CCV parcel out on Elm Street. That, that property, for some reason, was just a singular property that was in design review. Um, and that one was removed. National Life stayed in, but the boundaries were cleaned up to match the parcel lines. Um, we added the North Street of Barry out to Granite Street. Um, that actually helps to clean up an issue we have with the designated downtown boundary. Uh, we added in Downing Street. Uh, we added in the rest of crossroads neighborhood um now that's kind of gasoline alley so that's um currently if you were at, um on berlin on um, route two so you've got berlin and uh, memorial and main street and northfield street some of those properties are in design review but only um a couple of them so uh, Cumberland Farms and Dunkin' Donuts are not in design review, but the gas stations that are closer to the intersection are. And what we did was figured um, all of those should be in design review, um, to, just for consistency's sake. Out at Redstone, we added in a few properties, and three parcels on Terrace Street will be rezoned as a part of this. Um, they're currently res 6,000. They'll be changed to res 9,000 and will be part of 
the neighborhood out on Terra Street. Um, and there's a whole reason for that, um, but really it comes down to the fact that those are not historic. They're not in the historic district, and those were the only three properties in the Redstone North neighborhood that were not consistent. And those property owners have all been notified, and they've all agreed that they want to be moved into the Terra Street neighborhood. Um, and we'll address the Pioneer Street um, when we get there. So I will stop sharing for now and uh, see if you have any questions or if you were the public. Any questions from either the public or council? Uh, Eric, I see you down there. Uh, I think you're muted. Sorry, I'm sorry. That's better, huh? Yeah. Uh, I'm Eric Gilbertson. I am chair of the Historic Preservation Commission and sit on design review. And I want to thank the council for taking this up. We've been at it for three years and uh, uh, I'm here to answer any questions uh, that anybody might have. Uh, go ahead, Dan. Sure. Uh, first question I had actually, Eric, um, if you could address, so some of the preservation standards uh, Mike talked about last time and I just want to make sure that that um, I'm understanding them as well as the the public, which is that you've you've adopted sort of the mid level uh, preservation standards, so yes, that, that, that that's right. The standards for rehabilitation. I think that uh, probably almost all the projects that design review sees are that uh, are re that are involve an historic building or rehabilitation. And they're, they're pretty flexible standards. If you go into the standards for restoration, uh, they're very rigid. And we wanted this to be flexible enough that people could do reasonable things with their uh, buildings. And how, how are these new standards likely to be different than sort of the prior standards that we used, that we've used before in the past? I, I, I thought about that. I don't think they'll be much different. I mean, the good thing about these standards is they're nationally accepted standards. There's information and publications that can be used. Uh, I, so I, I think they're probably the easiest thing to do and a very defensible thing to do. So, so we don't have to consult the 1975 version of the cityscape anymore? That's correct. <laughs> that was that was very good, but my copy was uh, getting a little shop worn. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's a collector's item now. Um, yeah. So I, I guess the only other comment I would add is uh, I want to thank you and and Meredith and Mike for these changes. I think I think they make sense. You know, they seem to bring they seem to cure a lot of the inconsistencies that the old design control district had as far as standards go, as far as what was in the district and what was out. Um, and I guess the only the only third question, the final thing I would ask is, it, you know, was, was there a push at all to change, to separate out the design district from the historic district? Um, or was that a general consensus to keep it as a design we control had, district? We had discussions about it, but I, I, I don't think there was much interest in doing that because it's really a community that we're looking at, not just historic buildings. So, okay. All right. Well, thanks. I, I think this is great. This is a really uh, a lot of work and it shows, and I think it makes a better system than what we have now. We wouldn't have done it without the staff at the city. I could say Meredith has been great. And can't remember all the names of people before her, but they're all very helpful. She, and Mike's been very helpful. She's pushed them out of your mind. <laughs> yeah. Well, my memory for names is not what it used to be, and it was never very good. Uh, Donna. Uh, but Eric, your memory for buildings is still strong, and it, it, you're a very important presence to add to our staff. I'm, I'm so impressed that we can keep 
protecting the character of our community and yet still be more transparent and clear and rational about what we're requiring people to do. So I appreciate the changes and salute all of you that have been involved. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I think design review has made a tremendous difference in the way Montpelier looks over the last 40 years. And uh, we want to continue that. Keep Montpelier, Montpelier, right? Great. Uh, any further comments from either the council or the public? Okay. Um, Cameron, anyone? I don't think so. Okay. Um, all right. So I am going to uh, close the public hearing. And this is an item I think that we need to have a second public hearing on, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so do we need a motion to um, put this on the a, a future agenda? I, yeah, I don't know if we need a second oh, hearing. Okay. Yeah, it's, this is one of the odd ones. Um, the charter talks about ones that are adopted through um, chapter 5974-5960, which is um, different than chapter 117. So it's never been clear as to whether or not we follow the first or the other. Um, but typically in the past, we've had one. But if we want to have a second one just to get more public input, I'm more than happy to come back in a couple weeks. Uh, well, based on the public outcry here, um, I think we could probably just go with the one, is my sense. Uh, Dan and then Donna? OK, I, I'd, I'd support the one. But just to be clear, we're bifurcating the design review components and separate from the Pioneer yes. Street uh, yeah. issues. Okay. That's the next thing. Yep. Yeah. No, I, I'm perfectly comfortable having one, especially given the fact that, you know, while this is technically just one hearing, we have now given it two opportunities for people to give feedback. And yeah. um, it, it seems to be largely consensus. And I think that's a tribute to the work that the planning uh department and and eric and others did to um to create this yeah great um donna well i was actually oh, going to make a motion to approve the proposed cha uh, proposed changes to the design review overlay district is that the right terms mike i'm reading the late title here yes the, the overlay district and the map and the map okay Okay, is there a second? Second. Uh, okay, it's a motion and a second. That's it. Lauren, go ahead. You're muted. Uh, you're muted. By mute. <laughs> this is super nitpicky. I thought we were having a second hearing, so I was just going to email. It looks like on page, um, it was page 51 of the packet for tonight, or it's um, chapter 430, um, page 4-9. At the very top, um, 4301A, it says the administrative officer, and you crossed out shall refer all, and it says review any applications. I think it still needs the shall. Um, that, I can just email that to Cameron. That's the, the easiest way. But before we approve it, it makes no sense without there's just a missing word. But. Good catch. I will send that over. And uh, so uh, Donna and Dan, uh, you're OK with adding that to your um, motion? OK, with that understanding. Yeah. Don't, go ahead, Donna. I mute myself. I, I thought you could always do grammar as long as it didn't change the essence. So I'm glad we caught it. But yes, totally acceptable. Okay. Uh, so a motion in a second. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. So that passes. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Eric and um, Meredith and Mike and uh, everyone who uh, helped make that happen. It's been um, a long time coming, so I think it'll be great. Um, all right, so we have another um, uh, public hearing to do uh, around uh, zoning changes for uh, the uh, River Street, uh, Pioneer Street area. 
Uh, so I'm going to officially open a public hearing on that. And um, for this, again, since this is our first public hearing on it, I think probably it makes sense again to um, have you do a little overview of it, Mike, if that's okay with you. All right. So I'm going to, if I can share screen again for a quick second, I'm just going to put the map up because I think that'll be the easiest way to talk about this. You should have permission to do that now. Oh, good. It is this guy. Let me see if I can oh, move over. There we go. Okay. Um, so this is probably not the, the clearest map for everybody to understand what's going on, but this line here is Pioneer Street. This space going through here is the Winooski River. And this is uh, River Street that's heading out. So uh, we've got the laser wash car wash here. Um, Flag Works is here, uh, VFW. So um, hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea of uh, what part of uh, the city we're talking about. And what we have, uh, this is, a, so the colors, this area here is the residential, um, 1500, no, residential 3000, which is residential. These are some short little hill uh, neighborhoods up in here. This orangey color is the riverfront district. This is the rural parts of Sabin's Pasture. Um, and this is Eastern Gateway out towards the roundabout. So um, those are the different zoning districts. And the parcel we're really talking about tonight is. Um, a parcel that actually connects across the railroad tracks, this small, thin line cutting through here is the railroad. Um, and what we have here is the trading post and a vacant parking lot. And they also own this larger parcel that kind of goes out here that has a number of self-store units, uh, the, the uh, bare naked growler, um, some commercial buildings here. Um, and so hopefully everyone's got a sense of really about the area we're talking about. And what the proposal was, was they have this vacant land here, uh, the Barretts, and they wanted to go and make a, a proposal. And um, they didn't realize that in 2018, that the zoning had changed on their property. And so they were no longer going to be allowed to have self-store units. It becomes a non-conforming use. And most of their buildings and most of their uses also became non-conforming. So they were kind of um, caught a little bit by surprise and uh, asked the planning commission if they could go and change their zoning so that they could be Eastern Gateway, the purple that's down here. Um, and in that way, uh, the most of the uses that are on their property would become conforming. Um, the the structures may not be conforming because we now have new design requirements. Um, even outside of the design review district, we do have design requirements for new structures. Um, but uh, the laser wash is non-conforming and the uses in here are non-conforming. So they asked if we would um, take another look at, the planning commission would take another look at rezoning this area to match the Eastern Gateway. Um, Eastern, or the, yeah, Eastern Gateway in its description, the Eastern Gateway tends to be more auto-centric. Um, and um, this part, part of the argument for this is part of this, this side of this street does not have sidewalks. It's not really pedestrian accessible um, as much as, as other places as you get into more of these areas. Um, so that was a little bit of the sense was um, that could be one one way um, as this has been a property that's been owned by the family for a long time. One way we could help accommodate that. The planning commission looked at three different options. Um, the initial proposal was to also rezone the self store units that are already built. Uh, the planning commission opted not to. They said no, we don't want that to be rezoned. We'll just look at these pieces here um, that are on the street. Um, 
and they chose the option to rezone this to Eastern Gateway, but um, not not full throated endorsement. But they felt this was they, they wanted to help them out, and this was what they kind of settled on. Um, they did review other options, such as putting um, allowing self store units into the Riverfront District was another option that was explored. So. Um, I guess that's probably where I can leave it at this point. There were um, a number of options. I don't know if Brooke is here to answer questions on behalf of the the Barretts. I will stop sharing, um, and I can answer any questions that you have. Um, Mike, can I ask you a, a question about the Eastern Gateway District? Um, just for clarity, is housing um, allowed in the Eastern Gateway District? Uh, yes, but not to the, I, uh, I was hoping I had that right in front of me and I don't, um, have the zoning right in front of me. There is, um, I believe single and two family, but multifamily is not allowed in Eastern Gateway. Um, and maybe Meredith looks like Meredith has the answer to that. All right. Um, so uh, Meredith Crandall, zoning administrator. Um, in Eastern Gateway, actually all residential uses are allowed, but they're all conditional. So higher tier review requirements. Thank you. Um, sorry, I probably should not have uh, jumped right in there uh, with questions. I, I do want to um, give, um, is that Brooke uh, Dingle Dean and uh, is that Jim Barrett? Do you would you like to uh, address the council? Yes, thank you very much. Good evening. Yeah. Good evening. Um, my name is Brooke Dingle Dean. Can you hear me okay with my mask on? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I'm with the uh, I'm with a Barry Law Firm and um, I'm here with Jim Barrett and also Kelly Barrett of, ba of Barrett Enterprises. And Barrett Enterprises is a local business in Montpelier that's actually a family-owned business that's been in um, been around for over a hundred years. And during that time, they've paid a lot of taxes and employed a lot of people, and they have made a real success of the Pioneer Street parcel that they acquired in 1970. At that point in time, um, just to give you a little background on the history of this parcel. Uh, long, long ago in the, in the uh, uh, early 19th century and before, it was a tannery, and then there was a dam built on the river, and the what is now the Barrett parcel was used to generate power through that um, through the hydro dam in the area. It then turned into a coal-fired power plant in the early 19th century and eventually converted over to an oil-fired power plant that JMP owned, which um, in 1970, when the Barretts took over the property, it had uh, contamination on it. There were concrete bunkers on the property um, that had to be dynamited, and people were betting whether or not they could actually break them up and remove them from the property. Uh, they've spent massive amounts of money redeveloping this property since the 1970s. Uh, they paid, there was uh, these six concrete bunkers that had to be dynamited. It took over $100,000 in the 1970s to remove. There was a massive 80,000 gallon underground storage tank holding oil for all this oil fired plant that existed there to generate the electricity that had to be pumped and filled with concrete. Um, so these folks are, are very connected to this land. They've spent decades redeveloping it, cleaning it up, doing environmental assessments. And they have always been in the storage business since the 70s and in the 1980s began building self-storage units at this location and other areas around central Vermont. They run a really nice operation. They have many people and businesses in the area that appreciate the location and the convenience, including people that come on a daily basis to uh, get their supplies and equipment and material for their plumbing businesses, electricians, law firms with all sorts of uh, um, uh, files, um, uh, 
dentists, uh, Washington County Mental Health, um, many nursing homes in the area, local police personnel, restaurants, et cetera. This is a really important business. And in fact, they're at 100% capacity and have a waiting list because of that proximity to people's homes where they don't have garages and that kind of thing. So in the 1980s, the first uh, mid 1980s, the first self storage unit went up when that became an industry. And there are a total of 12 buildings on the Barrett property. And nine of them are the self storage unit buildings, which are all now out of compliance. Now, what does that really mean? Well, probably nothing because they will continue to maintain them into the future and have plans to do that for the, the long term. Um, so they would, may remain. Um, but they're in the in the Barrett's found out about the change in zoning through happenstance. They had no idea that their parcel was getting rezoned in 19 in uh, 2018. So this was a surprise when they went into the zoning administrator to do the last two buildings um, in the area that um, is actually, it's the parking lot area that's above the 18,000 gallon storage tank that was filled with concrete. Um, and they found out, well, you can't do this anymore. You've been zoned out of, the, you know, this is no longer a use. So that's how they came upon this information. They didn't realize that was going on or would have come to say, gee, this is an unintended consequence. Um, the other, the other portion, there's another parcel involved in this request as well, and that's the laser wash parcel. And um, those folks have expressed concern because, for example, now that they're a non-complying structure, they can't put vacuum cleaners out in the parking lot area where they wanted to because there's a local need for that. But that would be an expansion of a non-conforming use, and they wouldn't be allowed to do that. Um, so because um, 10 of the 13 um, structures on these two parcels are now in non-compliance, and the fact that the last portion of the development that the Barretts were planning on do now can't be done without them realizing that that was the situation. Um, we, we went to the Planning Commission. We worked with Mike Miller. Um, he was terrific in trying to help fashion some options for the Planning Commission. And um, what they ultimately decided on was, well, uh, the strip in between the railroad tracks and the actual road, um, if, that could re if that could be the Eastern Gateway, just expand it and continue the extension of that from the east into, you know, along the road. And then the portion behind the railroad tracks, between the railroad tracks and the river, could remain riverfront. And um, that would assist the Barretts in um, completing their plans. Um, Laser Wash could continue to operate and have a small expansion for their desires as well, while still honoring the purpose and the intent of what the change in zoning was designed to um, provide for in the future, which is um, making an area more accessible to uh, pedestrian or access to the river, that kind of thing. You know, the reality of it is, if we if the zoning doesn't change, it's it's not going to um, cause any in any short term time frame. There's not going to be a housing unit put up. The Barretts are not in that business, and this is a hole in their in their property now um, that they have finally been able to business wise. Um, be able to develop and it completes the um, you know what they wanted to do with the property now this isn't about them specifically and what I would ask you to, to think about and if you drive that area and you know it at all if you look at that map that Mike put up on the thing uh, first of all Eastern Gateway is across the road from at least the eastern portion of the Barrett property and if you drive that area it's a guardrail with an enormous amount of um, uh, trees, shrubbery, that kind of thing, because there's a real steep drop off. And there is no place to walk in that area on Route 2 on that side because of the guardrail. 
and it's a very steep drop off then to the Barrett property. And that continues for quite some time. And the only access to the property is through the entrance where the trading, when you get to the trading post actual building. Um, or of course you could enter on the other side of the railroad tracks from Pioneer Street. <clears throat> and then you would be able to access that Eastern portion of the Barrett property. Um, but there, you know, it wouldn't change anything in terms of um, alteration at the road because there is no access to any of those lands. So Mr. Barrett is here and he's um, happy to answer any questions about this. Um, is there anything that you want to mm -hmm. highlight, no, no. highlight for them? No, um, They've just invested a great deal of money, time, thought, and, and TLC on this property and now, the other thing I should point out is Eastern Gateway requires them to um, go through some uh, uh, aesthetic and buffering kinds of issues. They're happy to do so. Um, they're not asking for a reversion to the original zoning that they had prior to 2018. Um, and they're more than happy to comply to make this area look nice and keep this business a thriving business in central Vermont. All right, well, thank you. Um, so from here, I know we had a little bit of conversation about this uh, last time. And uh, at that point, I had said, you know, I have some hesitation around all of this, but um, I just wanted, I mean, I, I'm, I want to say that, uh, you know, I'm certainly open to this and want to want to think through it. Um, uh, I would like to think through it a little more, uh, but I want to check with the council if if you all are feeling um, clear, uh, you know, you want to move forward with this or um, clear that you don't. Um, that would be good to know uh, if if it seems like it's going to be relatively um, controversial, then I, I think it's okay to say let's um, let's let's talk about this some more. Let's think about it some more and um, put it on a, a, a further agenda uh, time and in, in the future if we're not uh, if we're not ready to approve it tonight um, so anyway I just want to put that out there as an option um, thoughts uh, Jay go ahead um, yeah and thank you and um, thank you to the Barrett family and and, and to all they've put in, into that land I, I think I share the sentiment that I, I think that it, this uh, deserves a little more time and attention and um, conversation. I do think that um, given the, the redevelopment on the other side of the river and the multi-use path that has been built out there um, and the potential for connecting um, folks to the river and connecting that space to downtown um, and uh, seeing a, a different type of future in the development of, of that space, I think it, I think it warrants additional conversation. So I don't know that I'm ready to move forward with a decision to, uh, tonight. Thanks. Thank you. Um, other thoughts. Uh, Dan, and then sure. Donna. Um, well, uh, you know, I. I I think that the the Barrett's point is is well taken, which is um, it's you know they've largely developed the area, and anytime you make what's developed already in the area a non-conforming use, I think that creates problems because you have that inconsistent. Uh, you know, you can't expand, you can't use the land as as it's really already been been used. Um, I think Jay's point is a good one, and I do see, I, I agree as well, that this is in the long term, um, I think this is one of the areas that we as a city really need to be looking at um, to th think about as Sabins is developed, as the multi-use uh, path is continued to be improved and utilized. Um, you know, this is in some ways another sort of downtown hub 
type center. And so today's uses are not necessarily going to be, you know, I think there's going to be uh, future planning about that, but I think that's really long-term thinking. I think that's over the long course of, you know, we, the planning commission needs to go back, needs to look, um, and we need to see how these lands develop. But at least at, at this time, I, I don't see, um, I guess I, I don't see necessarily a, a need to mull it over much more. I, I think, um, you know, I think the Barrett's use of this is is the established use and, and something that doesn't allow that use, I think, at, creates more problems in the short term. Um, and that what we're really looking at is long term thinking about this area. And it's not just the Barrett's property. It's the entire that entire intersection where the Pioneer Street Bridge and Route 2 meet, because I, I, I really do think there's a lot of potential there, but I think that's that's long-term and that's something we need to support in thinking about for the um, for the future. That's, that's just my thought. Thank you. Donna. Uh, well, I'm not sure, Dan, by the time you finished, I wasn't sure whether you'd vote yes or no, but uh, part of me agrees with both of you. And as much as thanks to Brooke, all your statements and background was very helpful to me. The difference I guess I perceive is that this section is up on a hill. It's not down by the shared use path. It's not even immediately except for the backside right against the river. And I do respect how much they've maintained and helped this economic growth here. But I also feel like going into the east, uh, what do you call it? east gate, uh, um, would have them add some beautification that they don't have now. And I really would like that. I'd like to support how they're using it, get them out of being out of compliance and help it to be a, a more beautiful. Uh, that it might be indeed the exception dealing at the fact that it is up on this sort of steep area right against the roadway. So I would be prepared to vote tonight, but I can certainly wait till the next meeting also. Jack. I'm with uh, with Donna. I, I, at our last meeting, uh, we heard this presentation and what I said was, well, you know, I really should get out there and walk the grounds and get a good sense of what it's like. And I did not do that before tonight's meeting, but I, I also thought that, uh, that Mike's presentation uh, with the map tonight was, was really very, uh, very informative and helpful. And so I don't wanna make my fellow counselors rush to a decision if, uh, if they're not ready, but I personally am ready and I would support it. Great, thank you. Uh, any other thoughts from council? Um, any thoughts from the public? And uh, um, Brooke or Jim, if you have anything you wanna add to it, that's okay too. Um, oh, uh, Bill, go ahead. Yeah, I meant to get in and then you guys got started. So I just wanted to weigh in uh, from my perspective. Uh, and again, you all can decide what you want to do. But uh, as I see it, uh, as I understand it, the proposal before you uh, is, is accept, you know, works for the Barrett's, the landowners. And, you know, with regard to future use, uh, if it were to convert to commercial or housing or whatever, um, you know, essentially you heard the testimony. I mean, the Barrett family isn't really interested in doing that. Not, not that they don't like the idea, but that's not what they do. So someone's going to have to buy it. And I think if someone was proposing to buy this property from the Barrett's and propose a major uh, proposal, you know, for the long run and met our long-term you know, vision, the council could certainly consider rezoning it. I'd also say that, and, and if that were the case, the addition of a couple more storage units or a couple of um, uh, vacuum cleaners isn't going to make it particularly more expensive to redevelop. It's you, you know, it's not like you're taking down brand new buildings with water and sewer and all these kind of things. I mean, storage units. I think I don't even think you have water and sewer, right? They're just a little storage with a slab underneath. So I, I think. 
it, you're not necessarily defeating your future vision here, especially with the hybrid that the planning commission has come up with. And um, and then and we're not holding up to you know whether you do it now or you want to take more time. I certainly would um, stand to support and urge you to support uh, the planning commission compromise and that I think works for the family. Yep. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I guess I just add on, on top of that, and I, I just to be clear from <laughs> Donna's statement, I'm, I'm fully in her and Jack's camp. Um, you know, if you look through the uses it, uh, on the chart in the zoning, you know, the riverfront and the Eastern Gateway are pretty much the same um, with some key exceptions, the key one being the, the storage units. Um, and so I, I don't feel like this is really a real, this is opening something drastic. And I, I would share, I think Bill put it more succinctly, what I was grasping for in my comments, which is that, you know, I think a lot of our concerns are thinking in this long term, but nothing here is, is going to prevent us from thinking about that in the long term. And, you know, a lot of our long term thinking about this and or that the Planning Commission's long term thinking is going to depend on on things that haven't happened yet. And so limiting the current use or ignoring the current use for um, some future prospect, I don't, I don't think makes sense, um, given that this can, can continue to be used in a manner that's been consistently, that it's been consistently used for, you know, as, as Brooke testified to or stated about 40 years. So um, I just, um, oh, Jack, go ahead. Uh, just very quickly, I know that everybody I talk to pretty much hates self-storage units, but every time one gets built, they get filled up. Clearly, the, our society, for whatever reason, has decided there's a value to doing them, and I think this is a sensible place for them. <laughs> Any other thoughts, Lauren or Connor? No, if not, that's okay. I think I could vote tonight. Sorry, say again. I, th I think I could vote tonight. Okay, you know something that I that I think is um, helpful for me in thinking about this is that uh, housing continues to be a at least a conditional use uh, for the Eastern Gateway, and so if you know, if the hope is that someday there's um, either housing or, or something like that in that area, that that's that this is not preventing that. Um, I'm correct in saying that, right, Mike? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, with that in mind, um, Lauren, anything you want to add? If not, that's okay. Uh, no, I mean, I, I think I share the general sense, you know, having heard more tonight, it was really helpful um, from from Brooke's presentation and the other comments. So um, I think I'm prepared to vote too. Also hopeful that, you know, the longer term vision we keep keep working towards, but it sounds like, you know, we can move forward with this for now and it doesn't seem like a huge change. Um, I, mean, I guess my only question is it sounds like the planning commission were torn. Like, is there something where, <laughs> where some perspective that hasn't been brought up that, you know, Mike or anyone like, um, what, what was making this such a hard decision on their part? If, if we're, it's being presented to us as pretty straightforward and not really that big a deal. Well, I think from the planning commission's perspective, they, they were first presented with a larger change. Um, so they had a lot of working around to kind of bring it back to, let's just look at the minimum that would be necessary to, to remedy the situation. Um, the one section next to the river is already built out. So we can, you know, we don't have to rezone that. So that was, took a lot of conversation to bring that back. And then they also, you know, they're, they're, you know, much more versed on the zoning and took a number of um, avenues of possible other changes of um, changing it just in a neighborhood or in a zoning district to allow just that use. 
and that would fix it for the Barrett's, but they wouldn't fix it for the, the car wash. And so they, they went through on a number of those points and, and, um, the, the, the exact case that Jay made was one of the, the big pieces that they worked and had a lot of question on, which was, you know, we just built the bike path. Um, you know, the Barrett's property is just on the other side of the river. And that was kind of where they drew the line and said, no, um, we, we shouldn't rezone the Northern piece that's next to the river. Um, we should leave that as riverfront. Yes. Everything will be non-conforming, but at the same time, um, those are all successful and we don't need to make those changes. Um, and so that was, that was where they really went around. And I think in their case, they, um, the planning commission always wanted to make changes to help. Um, they just had, um, a couple of meetings where there were a few, a few planning commission members short. So, uh, they had to get four votes and they had three, three votes for one and three, three votes for the other. And then, um, had to go to another meeting, um, just because, you know, three of them preferred uh, changing the, the zoning uses while three of them felt they would rather change the zoning district. So um, I think it was just a difference of, of way, the way of getting there. And when they had the second meeting, we had some people who weren't at the first meeting at the second meeting and they were able to, to pass um, and get that approved. Thank you, that's helpful. Yeah. Um, okay, well, is there anyone who'd like to make a motion? Uh, Dan? Sure, I'll, I'll make a motion that we uh, approve the change in zoning districts uh, along 186. Um, sorry, let me call this up. Um, along River Street? 186 River Street uh, from Riverfront Zoning District to Eastern Gateway District as proposed. I'll second. I okay. just want to clarify it's more than just 186 because it's also the, the sure. property next to it. Sure. The parcels, I, I, I can amend my my motion to the, the parcels um, uh, as indicated on the map in, in proximity to 186 River Street. And you're, you're cool with that, right, Connor? All good. Okay. Um, okay. Um, Further discussion, and this includes the public, if there's anyone from the public who would like to uh, weigh in about this. Cameron, anybody? Okay. I'm not seeing you, I'm sorry, I was on mute. That's okay. I could also read your lips. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so any further discussion? All right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Post. Okay, so um, the motion carries, and oh wait, because I think we have to go through a roll call. Yeah, um, right. I'm just going to go through the order in which you appear on my screen. Uh, uh, Dan, aye. Connor, aye. Donna, aye. Jack, aye. Lauren, aye. And Jay, opposed. Okay, uh, so the motion carries, and um, thank you everybody um, for your thoughtfulness about this. And uh, uh, yeah, thanks for the to the planning commission and and uh, uh, Brooke and Jim. So thank you very much, folks. Okay, um, so it is eight thirty. Um, I think we might need a quick break. Um, so let's see, we've got, uh, up next is the, uh, temporary, uh, uh, parking ordinance, public hearing, and then, uh, community policing discussion. Um, I might reverse the order of those two, uh, is my guess. So we'll, uh, how do you feel about, do you need five minutes, 10 minutes? What do you think? 10. Oh, <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm seeing 10. Um, all right, so I'll see you back here at 840, and we'll pick it up uh, with the community policing from there. All right, thanks.
community policing discussion. Um, yeah. Oh, Bill, are you sure? I don't get it. Yeah, I was, I was going to say just pass the other thing, but nobody's here for it, so. That was my question. If anybody was here for it, then, you know, it's easy. We could just do it. But I, I think it's really fair to, to do this one um, first. So, um, all right. So just so everybody knows um, how this conversation will be structured, uh, we are going to first hear from our um, police chief and uh, about uh, his work and uh, investigation that he's done uh, about the police department. Uh, and then from there, uh, we will go directly to uh, public comment. And then, uh, and again, you know, everybody is um, welcome to uh, participate again, say your name and uh, where you live and try to keep your comments at two minutes. That'd be great. And then, um, and then the, the council will uh, reflect on um, what they've heard. So we'll go from there. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to turn things over to, uh, Chief Pete. Welcome. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, uh, distinguished members of the council, uh, city manager, assistant city manager. Um, I've had the, the privilege, um, to come here to Montpelier and, um, to join this, 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 this community. And I, and I've seen firsthand on what makes it special. And, uh, and I can tell you that um, uh, I, I believe you have, and I know you have a department of uh, professionals who are committed um, to doing the best that they can in serving their community. And, and, uh, and, and I, it, it, I, I've given um, eight slides to uh, uh, the Cameron has them. I think we're probably gonna go with those really quickly, but um, it, they're, they're based in, in part, well, they're based entirely on the assessment that I did and I looked at it very impartially and I came in in just full disclosure. I've been to a lot of police agencies and organizations and you're wondering, okay, is this just, um, is this just a show? Is this, or is it really the real thing? And, and I walked away believing that it's the real thing and knowing that it's the real thing. I, I looked for certain indicators. I looked for things to, to see if there's, um, there's an exclusion it's just one thing to have the right policies. It's one thing to say that we have benchmark policies that we're doing what PERF for the IACP is telling us to do. And it's an entire another thing to have a culture that believes in those policies and implements those policies. And I can tell you that the Montpelier Police Department has that culture. It's not just a, well, this is what we're supposed to do. Um, this is what we do. And this is what we expect from each other. Um, so culture is what enforces and makes policies work, not just in Montpelier, but I think in any organization um, out there that, that human bodies are part of. Um, I've looked for early warning indicators, um, things that would lead to or suggest that there is a detached culture um, that would rob from community policing practices, from models, and that would contribute to an us versus them mindset. And I can tell you, I, I did not see that. Um, it was not over. Um, so if I may ask if Cameron could put those slides on the screen or thank you, ma'am. So the, the initial findings, um, uh, a review of in, in statistical data uh, that's, you know, the state police just released out what they were seeing with their traffic stops. So if, you, um, if, if law enforcement stops someone here in the state, you can either give them a warning, you can give them a ticket, you could even look at uh, if there's an arrest that stems from that interaction, or even if you search the vehicle. Uh, all those data points um, we're, we're available here in Montpelier and we're working to put those on the, on the website uh, to, to bring more transparency and accountability. Um, but in the reviewing of that initial data uh, shows that there's no, I have no impression, there's no indications of, of targeting um, of, to people, especially uh, disadvantaged uh, populations, people of color, socioeconomic status, anything. Um, the current policies and practices that the department has had for a long time. It's not like a, hey, we better get our act together. Uh, the lead two years ago, we, we started doing everything correct. No, there's a consistency of policies and practices that are rooted in, in, in best practice models. Uh, as I mentioned before about the culture that is strong and professional and that um, community concerns 
primarily revolved around anything of, of like the criminal nexus. You go to certain places and people say that I'm concerned about drugs. I'm concerned about um, uh, the opioid e epidemic. I'm concerned about a lot of robberies happening around schools. I didn't get any of that. The, 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 the criminal compliance based thing that I heard the most was people are speeding too much and we need to do something about it. Um, so uh, so that was positive to me as well, um, that this community, uh, to my, my hats off to the community for that, um, because the community can only allow itself to be policed. Police have to have that legitimacy to do that. So that's, that's, a, that's a reflection uh, of the culture of the community. Um, and then there were those community concerns that related to the institutional culture of law enforcement, which I think everyone agrees who needs work? Um, but uh, so, so those conversations uh, kind of tilted towards what does MPD do to hold itself accountable and transparent to the community that it serves? And if I may ask for that. Thank you, ma'am. So um, of the, uh, the community discussion topics, the most prevalent were um, there is an overwhelming uh, desire to see officers in the best of times and not just in the worst of times. So for high visibility, foot patrols, positive interactions, more positive interactions that officers are having, not just, you know, we only see you when there's a call for service or um, when we do see you in your car, you don't have that much time to stop and talk to us. And, and there, there are those efforts. Officers are taking those efforts, but there are administrative functions that are keeping them from being able to be more proactive in their community uh, in police immersion efforts. Um, there is, of course, there was concern about the increase in the homeless population and MPD's role and how we're going to help to address that situation. Uh, I think the Vermont Digger had, had a recent article that said, uh, I think like 13 or 14 percent of the state's homeless population is here in uh, Washington County. So that's a big concern of the community as well. The school resource officer is also a big concern. Um, a lot of folks saying that because of national models, they think that police officers are, 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 are traumatizing towards children. Um, but um, I, I, what, what the Montpelier Police Department is doing, it's doing right. And it's doing, and what it does do, it's, it doesn't do what other departments do. It has accomplished and succeeded and excel at what other departments want to be. Um, so I'll say that with the SRO program. Uh, again, then we've had the national conversation of, of racial and systemic violence, uh, police brutality, the roles of policing. Um, questions were: Are there others? Are there service? Other services or other organizations that can can do those various calls of service um, better than than police officers? And, and I wholeheartedly agree to that. Um, and then there's the mental health uh, component with related calls to for police services. And again, um, I'm grateful that Gary Gordon and Susan are on the line, and they're going to go probably more into depth uh, and then can answer some other questions as it regards to um, a crisis intervention. So the six pillars of 21st century policing are what, what I went at and looked through. This is the benchmark. This is widely, um, this is what's accepted as the golden standard, um, what police departments should be doing. And this stems back from um, a, a pa panels of experts uh, of and who discuss what makes a department successful. And again, uh, I'm not sure if most people know this, but Tony Fakus played a part in that. Tony Fakus was down there at the White House talking about <laughs> what policing should look like, which also lends itself to the fact that the Montpelier Police Department has been recognized as a department that's doing it correctly. And what are you doing that you can broadcast out to other departments and agencies so they can mirror the relationship that you have with your community. So I think that's a hats off to the men and women and to the city um, for that accomplishment. So um, one of the, the, the first gentlemen I met with Ari, he, he, it was a great conversation. And um, he, it stuck with me. He said, I want you to dream bigger. I want you to think about how these things work. So he introduced me to the first paradigm here on the left uh, that talks about, um, and I hope I'm doing it justice and I'm rec uh, recalling it correctly, but he talked about like the personal, the cultural and structural influences that, that can affect organizations, that can affect beliefs. And that brought me over to um, Dr. Joseph Noyes, um, 
uh, belief transformation cycle. So this is, he's part of this group. Uh, well, they founded the group with the systemic um, uh, diversity and inclusion group. And it's talking about how do you transform belief systems? Because we're all, all of our experiences, whether they're taught or whether they're experienced, um, this is how we come into that fold. So how do we disrupt that cycle? So policing to me is nothing but symptomatic of, of society at large. Um, what happens in the society happens in microorganisms to include teaching, policing, um, healthcare, politics, you name it, it's all there. So what can the Montpelier Police Department do? That's what we have control over to disrupt the cycle, to make sure that as we're policing, we're aware of anything internally that will that will not allow us or that would reduce the amount of service that we're giving to anyone within our community. And we want to make sure that we have that emotional intelligence about ourselves to, to realize this and to make sure that we see everybody the same way and, and we and our service is based in on that. And again, I want to emphasize that I have not seen that within the, within the department, but I think this is, we don't want to stay stagnant. We want to move forward. So this is, so with these paradigms in mind, we want to base um, strategic goals that are, that are founded in how do we make sure that we, we, we emphasize ways to, to remind each other that we're all human and we all have the same things, the same goals, wants, desires, thoughts in common. Uh, so that's what the strategic plans will be based in. So again, officers should not be doing the work of, of other places. We're, we're not claiming to be social workers. We're not claiming to be doctors, but yet we, it's incumbent upon us to do everything we can to provide the best possible service out there. So we need to be trained in things like uh, first aid. We need to be trained in crisis de-escalation um, because we're looking towards uh, peaceful ways to resolve conflicts but we have to be conscious of mission creep. So we can't, that's one of the things that has gotten us into this problem in the first place, that officers can't be expected to be uh, school counselors. They have another intricate role to play in the school system, for example. But um, so we have to be cognizant of that mission, mission creep thing, which happens everywhere. Um, but every responsibility, every organizational structure out there is essential and it plays a vital role and it neither should be competing with one another. All of us should be working with each other for a common goal. The department has been doing that. And as I'm here, we will continue to do that and we will ramp it up to the highest level we possibly can. This slide talks about the, uh, the strategic goals that came out of the 17 uh, page assessment. Um, and I based because of the urgency of the situation, I think that we need to seize on this moment and we need to act on this moment. And those who are serious about um, uh, making institutional change to our, to our profession are going to be involved in those conversations and their input's gonna be heard and it's gonna be valued. Um, so we've uh, I've, I've put in uh, strategic goals based on those uh, six pillars of 21st century policing. The first of which I think um, uh, is the most important would be to implement a body-worn camera program. Now that comes with a lot of other things, uh, but the primarily among them being funding. And I'm extremely cognizant of um, budget limitations prior to COVID and especially with because of what we're dealing with now. So we're going to, this is something that we want to make sure that we're responsible stewards. So I'm going to go out there and look for those resources to bring these here um, uh, for this department. And if I can, uh, we've also, there was also a BJA grant that I just applied for that just closed out last week for um, if we get it, it would allow us to have a four year, um, to pay for four years worth of having a body worn camera si uh, program system here. So in looking at, uh, that, so the, the philosophy that uh, the paradigms that I spoke of before, this is where, um, where I think that it would come into play. So one of uh, the pillars calls for a robust interaction with policing. Now, um, oversight uh, is done uh, by, <laughs> there's already civilian oversight. There's my boss, there's uh, both of my bosses, and there are elected officials who are tasked and held accountable 
to um, to oversight for this department. So I think that it's it's better to have um, a, a strategic advisory board of community members who are selected by a community that can provide our department with advice, input, and, and, and help us to generate ideas on how we can meet our community policing and strategic goals. A lot of times you can't see the forest when you're inside the trees. I can look at things from a police standpoint all day. I, I've got a mental health background as well, but I don't do this every day. So I, I, I got to make sure I'm catching everything that's being, that's, that's, that we're seeing and what we're supposed to be doing so that we do this with a partnership. So this group, I think, would just brainstorm ways to help us improve systemic diversity, um, make sure that we're maintaining socioeconomic equality, uh, inclusion, exposure, and um, with the goal of true impartiality for policing. So these would be things like, um, we want to talk about um, implicit bias training. Well, how do we go out into the community? Are there experts within Montpelier that can help us do this? Or do we go to the Anti-Defamation League to get this trained? How do we bring it back? Are there, are there volunteers in the community that can help us do this? All the way to things like we understand that um, it's a male-dominated career field. How do you attract women? to come into this profession? How do you attract people of color to come into this profession? Um, if we have uh, if we have partnerships with group like the Rainbow Coalition and NAACP and women in law enforcement, we can, can tap into those resources to say, hey, come to our awesome city, come to our great department and be part of something that's bigger than yourself. And, and we can brainstorm those ways and have those resources and that, that that access that we otherwise don't have because of the population uh, breakup of the state of Vermont. So I think that a group like that to help us um, set the vector on where we wanna go and give us ideas that we might not otherwise know or have would be crucial in helping us meet that community partnership goal. And then the last slide, I believe, to talking about, um, again, one of the key elements that was brought up throughout the, the conversations with the community is um, I would look at, I am working right now towards developing a CIT program. And that CIT program is not just going to be for officers here and staff and dispatchers here in Montpelier Police Department, but we're going to open it up to the entire state. And we're going to, everybody's got lack of ref, uh, uh, resources right now. We're going to do it in a way that we're not going to charge people hundreds of dollars to do it. It's just going to, if you can make it come and we'll cover it. Uh, and we'll find creative ways to make sure we can cover things like supplies and um, to print out workbooks and USB uh, ports to, to send people home with the information. But we want to make sure that we, we bring this type of training to as many people as possible because it saves officers' lives and it saves the lives of our, our, our public and our, our, and our community. So we want to bring this out as much as possible. Chief, uh, if I can interrupt you for one second, could you just uh, spell out what does the CIT acronym stand for? Yes, ma'am. I apologize. So the CIT is crisis intervention training, and that's based off of, uh, it, it's just, it's a 40-hour, very robust training system that uh, officers, uh, so we have a, a Team 2 model here in Vermont. That's a day's training, and it gives officers familiar with the resources. And Gary Gordon, again, is on this call. He can speak to it um, probably more specifically than I can, but CT, uh, CIT ramps it up a notch. And, and it talks about, just like Team 2 does, bringing in peers and people who have lived experiences to share with, with, with officers, but it has other components like that. It has components that talks about officer safety and wellness. It has, um, there's even exercises in which we have a, um, a headphone system that gives for disassociate personality disorder, so you know, schizophrenia, when you're hearing voices. So we do exercise like, hey, put these, these headphones on and now we're gonna try to do this exercise and now you tell me how easy was that for you? And now you know what that person is going through that you come into contact. Now here are some good ways to reach people who are in crisis to de-escalate the situation. One of the things that we've learned, for example, is, and I'm sorry, I could talk all day on this stuff, <laughs> but um, one of the things that we've learned is um, one of the first things police officers want to do is what can hurt you the most, it's hands. So the tactical thing is, let me see your hands. Please keep your hands out of your pocket. Please keep your hands out of your shirt. And that brings me to, I'll digress for a second, but talking about seminars to the public that explains to the public where our tactics are, what their rights are when they're stopped and pulled over. We're not trying to play getcha with anybody. We want people to know their rights because we, we abide 
by their rights. And so if we can provide information out there to let people know why we do what we do, and if that's going to decrease conflicts, that's going to decrease arguments, that's going to decrease um, uh, knee-jerk reactions on both parts, then we're going to do everything we possibly can to elude from that. But going back to CIT, it's one of those things that you're trained all the time, show me your hands, don't have anything in your hands. If you, but a lot of people who have are in crisis, one of the first things that they're doing is they're smoking because the nicotine helps them bring them down. From the, it helps them relax. And what are we doing as police officers when we come to the scene? I need you to put that cigarette out. <laughs> no, if I know you're in mental crisis, I want you to sit down and drag on that thing as much as possible. And when you're calm, let's talk. How can how can we help you? And um, so those are like those little things are, are are pivot points that can make the difference between literally life and death in certain situations. So it's incumbent upon us to provide that knowledge and that information, that training. Um, uh, to our people and to as many poss our officers as possible. So um, so we have partnered with, as you all know, with the Washington County Mental Health Services, um, Barry uh, Police Department, uh, to have a co-responder model with Montpelier. And that's also a best practice model. And it's being done in a lot of places and it's being done well. And as Gary, I think, alluded to earlier in the call, that is something that our neighbors to the south are have been doing successfully. So with that, um, if Gary, if you and Susan are still on the line, uh, would you mind talking a little bit more about mental health um, crisis intervention and the partnership? Okay, well, as I said, alluded to earlier, um, this is something that we've been having conversations about uh, for quite some time um, and it's finally reached fruition. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with, particularly with the times with the, that we're in. Um, and also with the fact that in our particular community, I haven't been a, a, a crisis clinician for the last 28 years and haven't been uh, working very closely with these two departments, as well as the state police and also the Washington County Sheriff's, they receive a large volume of calls that have a mental health component. So part of the thinking is this, is that, um, and we've also had, as, as, as you're all aware, we've had incidences that have had tragic consequences um, and we've had incidences where there have been question marks about the ability of police to respond and also the ability of mental health to respond. So part of the, the um, response to that was for us to, was the development of the Team 2 model that we developed uh, shortly after Drop was on Irene when uh, Mary Moulton was temporarily the uh, Commissioner of, of Mental Health. Um, and the idea behind the Team 2 model was to foster closer collaboration between law enforcement and mental health crisis clinicians because we are often in the field together responding to these types of calls. Um, in Washington County in particular, we have been a mobile team since 1974 when Dr. George Brooks, who was uh, at the state hospital at the time, wrote the first grant for a mobile response team, which he called the World Screeners. So we have a history of being mobile uh, since that time period. Um, but what we found um, and what law enforcement had been saying frequently to us is that the volume of calls with the mental health component was so high that um, we needed more, that we needed an expansion of the ability for uh, mental health clinicians to assist officers in the field. Um, because, for example, Washington County, we have two crisis workers on um, at a time. So we have two crisis workers on, we work 12 hour shifts and there are two of us on. And we're busy enough that a lot of times when the police agencies call us, we cannot respond immediately. We may be in the emergency room, uh, we may be out with another law enforcement officer, we may be somewhere else in the community. And this was putting them in a precarious position, uh, position a lot of times because we weren't able to respond in a timely fashion um, so the idea was, was having somebody embedded with the department, somebody who could be with the officers to respond to these calls. Um, and so that's how we arrived at the, we finally were able to get um, the Department of Mental Health and the two agencies to come together and, and to uh, provide the funding for this. And we've seen the results um, in Southern Vermont, in, um, in, in Brattleboro and Springfield and these areas that ACRS covers, we're seeing the results in St. Albans the impact that it's having, the feedback that they're getting of, of the um, efficacy of having a mental health crisis worker on the scene with officers, because even, even some of the calls that aren't necessarily identified as mental health calls, um, 
as we all know, a lot of times when, when the blue lights show up and the uniforms show up, there's a heightened response. Um, people have reactions to police officers, particularly people in the population that we, comp that we frequently have to encounter. The homeless population, um, the people who are on the peripheral of, of you know, in and out of, of criminal behavior and in the uh, criminal justice system, um, the so-called underbelly of society, these are the people that we often, you know, frequently have to deal with. And a lot of them do have underlying mental health issues. And although the officers have a certain degree of training, um, that's still not, as, as, as uh, Chief P said, you know, that's not their primary focus. Um, but we do have people such as myself, crisis conditions that, that this is our primary focus. And we, when, and when we are on the scene, we, I believe we make a difference. I, I've been on multiple scenes myself with officers where we've made a difference by being there and able to, and um, we're able to help deescalate the situation. We're able to do an assessment, a mental health assessment of the person and, and connect them with the resources that they need. Um, so that's the whole thinking behind, part of the thinking at least behind having an embedded clinician so part of part of Susan's role will be to respond with the officers. If de-escalation is needed, she can do that. If comfort is needed, she will provide comfort. Um, if uh, she needs to do a mental health assessment, she'll do a mental health assessment and make the appropriate referrals. Um, she will be in contact with all of the other resources that are available to individuals. Because one of the things that we recognize is that a lot of times people just aren't aware of the resources that are available, which contributes to their crisis. Um, so she will over time become familiar with all those, those resources. Um, and as she is more comfortable with them, she'll be making referrals to all of the partners that we work with. Um, and, um, and hopefully that will, we will see um, an impact on the community in terms of, of how we're able to better serve the population that we work with. I don't know what to add to uh, to those comments. I wanted to reiterate what Chief Pete said about um, what an amazing community that there is here. Um, I've been so impressed already with the degree to which different organizations are working together and um, with law enforcement here and the way that they interact with the public. Um, today I was out and about in the community with one of the officers who introduced me to many people um, that that officer has gotten to know just from walking around and building relationships and um, that's so impressive and quite honestly different from many of the places that I have lived before. Um, I think that mental health is a very specific skill set and law enforcement is a very specific skill set and there's a definitely an overlap between the two. Uh, but I think working in collaboration like this is such an outstanding model because it really allows for each person to focus on what they do best. Um, and have the most tools available at one time to try to provide assistance in whatever form that it seems most helpful in any given situation to that individual. So I am thrilled to be here in this role and really looking forward to um, growing it with all of you. So thank you for having me here tonight. And, and thank you both for your time. I know it's it's pretty late. And uh, even just this morning, this afternoon, there was a gentleman outside and I saw uh, Susan, she was already at work talking uh, with this with this gentleman uh, who was out front. So um, so, so the department is making uh, continuous strides uh, to meet the, the, the high expectations and the rightfully so high expectations of the people of our community. And with that, uh, again, I thank you for the opportunity to be here. I thank you for the chance to provide you with the assessment and I stand ready to answer any questions of the council or the public. Great, <clears throat> thank you so much, Chief. Um, so at this point, uh, we're gonna take comments from the public. Um, I just wanna make a comment too that um, last time we had a, uh, discussion about policing, there was uh, a number of comments that uh, repeated the same 
script and I, I just want to say just from a purely personal perspective um, that uh, I would encourage if anyone is, is planning on doing something similar, I would encourage you to speak from your heart and um, not necessarily from a script. Uh, it, it just it actually just helps um, me and I'm sure it probably is true for others. Um, it helps me engage with what people are saying when it's um, not repeated. Um, if you want to do that, perfectly fine. You certainly can. Um, I just, you know, wanted to give that little editorial um, about that um, for whatever it's worth. Uh, but having having said that, um, if there are folks who would like to comment now, it's time. So again, don't forget to say your name um, and where you uh, live. Um, so who can, um, yeah, yeah, so yeah, we have a list of folks right now. So okay, so yeah, Cameron, do you have a um, a list already going? Yeah, it would be really great if people could use the raise hand function. Uh, so far, I have Morgan Brown, and I just heard Steve Whitaker's phone. So you guys are in the queue. If anyone else would like to speak, if you could uh, wave or raise a hand or do an emoji or something, so I could see you, uh, Morgan, you're first on our list. Thank you. Um, and I see Sean um, Stevens as well. Um, anyone else um, want to give a wave as to what's that, Cameron? I have a so I have Morgan, Stephen, Sean, and Lauren, Allison, Byron's or Burns. I'm sorry if, if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, Carolyn Wesley and Isla or Isla. I I guess. Isla. Isla, I apologize, and then we'll go from there. Okay, yep, so, all right, so Morgan, you are up first. Go ahead, Morgan. Yes, um, my name's Morgan Brown. I live in District 3. Um, I just wanted to say that, um, first off, I want to give a little correction uh, with apologies to Chief Pete. CIT actually stands for Crisis intervention team training emphasis on team and um that can be found online very easy um it it's very easy to get confused and call it crisis intervention training but it's actually team is an important uh term and uh that's that's the uh, third uh, that's a third letter the t anyway i want to uh really thank Chief Pete for uh, um, being willing to bring CRT crisis intervention team training to uh, Montpelia and elsewhere in Vermont where it already doesn't exist. Um, there is one community uh, uh, in Vermont that has implemented it. And um, I'm trying to remember the name. I think it might be Hartford or something like that in the White River Junction area. Anyway, um, I, for a long time, I've been advocating for a CIT training, you know, to come to Montpelier and elsewhere in Vermont. And I'm, I'm really grateful to the chief for uh, being willing to do this. I think it's essential. I think it'll save lives. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, unless you're not done. I'd just like to finish if I can. Uh, I I support Chief Pete in this endeavor, and uh, I think it's very important. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. Uh, Stephen, you're up next. Uh, yeah, I hope you can uh, cut me a little slack on the two minutes. This has been... Uh, I I was on the Langdon Street walk around on the night the first night that the chief joined us, and I made specific overture there and said I I've got to speak with you about a 30 year history here and a deep experience with the department. Uh, I was not afforded an opportunity. In fact, I was uh uh you know around the uh, toilet uh, public toilet signs and the planners. The ladies who destroyed the art project uh, were let off scot free, and he put his resources around accusing me. So, and we've got an officer, our school resource officer, 
who actually put two false statements in those papers. And and then we've got your detective who refused to inquire, even in, in, to even, uh, I'm sorry, interview the perpetrator who made off with some thousand dollar speakers of mine to assess his motive. You know, when you talk about building trust in the community, the homeless folks are not, don't, I mean, I, I actually watch folks passing counterfeit bills. I'm not, I don't trust the department enough to call them. Neither do the folks who have, have their beers, their unopened beers stolen by the officers. You know, Billy is not a, a sloppy drunk. He doesn't go out and create a problem, make a lot of noise. And the officers come and confiscate his beers. And I've told you this. You, you've got a long way to go to build trust. You know, this department has a $3 million budget. And we're scrap, scrapping for 30000 for homeless services. I mean, we need to put this in perspective. We've got way too many officers chasing speeding cars, not enough crime to warrant a $3 million department. Maybe we ought to take about half of that budget and put it into mental health and homeless services, you know, to, to address this. But when you've got a chronic history of crime and corruption where I've taken internal affairs complaints and had the officer sweep it under the rug and say, I'm about to retire, why should I make waves? You know, Mr. I've had officers stealing my own property from M and M Beverage that had been it's saying possession is ninety percent of the law. You've got you've got a and now you've got people who are working alongside Officer Matthews who are helping her cover it up. And that's what breeds corruption. When you turn complicity in in unfair prosecutions and unfair confiscations and, you know, un poor detective work, when you turn a blind eye to that, and you create this blue wall. I warned uh, Susan today that you know you're going to be asked to come, to be, you know fall into the blue wall and keep the secrets. But that that's why this model may not work. But we've we've got a long way to go to build trust, and it's not about using you know fancy buzzwords. But the fact that these forums happened and over the chief didn't even seek it to hear from me even though I reached out first and said, I got stuff you need to know about. The, the public records accountability, it's been a year since I've been trying to get the records of the Mark Johnson shooting. No one has come up with the transcript of the video, the diagrams, the measured distances. The All right, witness so Stephen, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you here. You're, I'm um, sure you are, but you're going to uh, down three because minutes. this is very uh, stuff you need to hear. Talking. You know? All right. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, all right, um, Sean. Hi. Wow, you guys put in long hours. Um, so uh, thank you for your work. Um, so I'm Sean Stevens. I live in Montpelier. I'm in, I think, District 2. Um, and um, I will be super brief because it's late. And I know there's other people that are part of the group that I'm part of who would also like to speak, and they have young children, so this is hard for them that it goes on this late. So um, I, um, I've i been putting in a lot of reading and soul searching about the issues of racial justice and, and policing over the last several months, like I'm sure that everybody is. And really, I've come down firmly in favor of trying to defund the police. I'm putting a full stop after that period. I think it's important. Um, we know that the safest communities in America are the ones that don't center the police. Um, I have a list of demands that was put forward by the group that I'm part of, and I got nominated to read it. So I'm going to read it in just a minute. Um, I, I want to also point out that there was an interesting LA Times article a while ago that analyzed more than a million calls they came into the LA Police Department and found that 92% of those calls did not require a response by an officer authorized and armed to use force. So in other words, um, this is basically the mission creep that Chief Pete was just talking about. And I think what we are proposing here is a mission rollback, that we move funding away from the police and towards true community safety. So there are 11 demands. I emailed them recently. So in theory, you, you probably have received them. 
number one, and, and I'm going to read this, but then nobody else is going to have to reread it. So there won't be the repetition that you were commenting on, Anne, and I Thank you. hope that that will make everybody a little less crazy. Number one, um, we, do, okay, so we demand the following. Number one, support efforts to remove the SRO, or the school resource officer, from our schools. Number two, enact the fair and impartial policing policy that was brought forward by migrant justice and allies to stop collaboration with ICE, joint terrorism task forces, and other surveillance structures. Number three, enact a moratorium on police raises for three years, including not hiring for vacancies, and create a study committee to research defunding, oversight, bargaining, and other issues. Number four, prioritize shifting funding from next year's city budget from police to social services, including but not limited to affordable, house, affordable housing, healthcare, including mental health, food security, and economic empowerment. Number five, enact and enforce a residency requirements requirement for all officers with no exceptions or grandfathering in. Number six, have traffic and parking enforcement conducted by unarmed traffic agents. Number seven, ban the use of all prison labor by the city and, and all contracts with the Department of Corrections. Number eight, ban the use of surveillance technology, such as body cameras, facial recognition, etc., and bar procurement of military-style equipment and chemical weapons. Number nine, have the police department report directly to the city council on any lobbying efforts. Number 10, open police contract negotiations to the public scrutiny, participation, and approval. And the last one, number 11, as part of your ongoing process to review city ordinances, change them to limit police power, such as to decriminalize public order and survival-based offenses. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Sean. Um, Lauren. Oh, um, Bill, do you want to? Sean? Yeah. Sean? I, I just tried to find your email and I couldn't. Um, yeah, sure you it, but if you if you wouldn't mind resending it to me at your convenience, just so we have it fully written. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, um, Lauren. Hi guys. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Hang on one more second, Lauren. Um, Connor, do you have something? Is yeah, right? I just hope to ask uh, Sean a couple of questions. First of all, Sean really appreciated your comments uh, earlier on the painting. Um, I'm just trying to get clarity in my own mind. So would this be a formal group with a name who all shares the same set of recommendations? Um, or is it just, is it a bit looser with? Uh, it is, so I'm just it, wondering, it, it, like, uh, you know, as far as having meetings outside council, is there a point person to contact that type of thing? It's, it is an informal group. Many of us are also members of Surge, Standing Up for Racial Justice or Black Lives Matter or... Um, various other organizations, but no, this is a an ad hoc organization that got put together by a group of us. Um, I, I decline to say that there's a point person, although some of the people who come after me may, may disagree with me and give themselves as a point person, that would be their prerogative. Great, great. And can I just ask to clarify when you say lobbying efforts by the police should come directly to council? I'm not sure I know what that means. Yeah, well, that's the problem that I have with, I have, I, I gave this list, but I personally didn't compose every item. But my understanding is that sometimes the police chief or some other representative from the police department will lobby the state legislature and that we would like to know when that happens. I, I believe that's what that refers to. And I can get back to you with details about that. Thanks so much, Sean. Yeah. Great, thank you. And Lauren, I'm sorry for interrupting you. Thank you. You you are on. No problem. Um, so I just want to thank you guys for continuing to engage public discourse on this important topic. Um, my name is Lauren Griswold and I live here in town in District 1. Um, so I envision a Montpelier where the needs of our marginalized communities are met just as well as those of our most privileged communities. Um, I'm concerned about the MPD's past conduct and by the fact that many BIPOC and Montpelier don't feel safe and are not safe around the police. Changing policing is a critical piece of a larger mission to make Montpelier a more equitable, just, and welcoming place. That's why I'm calling on the City Council to heed the demands that Sean just stated. 
Um, I mean, as an overwhelmingly white city and city council, we can keep our heads under the sand, considering systemic racism in the police force, a Minneapolis problem, a Buffalo problem, a Seattle problem, a Philadelphia problem, a Kenosha problem, um, and in so doing, continue to ignore the needs and demands of our BIPOC Montpelier residents and visitors. I wanted to share just a little anecdote um, from the large Montpelier protest that was organized in response to George Floyd's murder. When I was leaving, I passed two Montpelier police officers standing watch by the state house. In passing, I said, I hope you guys are taking a serious look at your department, you know, in a neutral tone. I don't know, I was dressed professionally. <laughs> um, one of the officers basically rolled his eyes at me. I mean, I don't care if the Montpelier Police Department is the cleanest performing police department in the state or the country. I think in this time with police brutality filmed night after night across the country, every single department needs to be looking at itself seriously and respecting when the public bring that up. Um, we've heard a lot of accounts about how pristine the culture at the MPD is, but how can the culture of one part of a system be immune from a systemic trait that's proved itself present across the system? There's simply no disclaimer exempting any police department from institutionalized racism. The easy path here is to put on these rosy Vermont exceptionalism lenses. I compel the council to take the harder path to do everything in your power to listen when BIPOC speak, when BIPOC organizers in this state on the steps of our city's capital building demand a much more serious conversation about our state's police departments. While I really appreciate that the council and Chief Pete have accepted public comment on this urgent matter, I want to push the council to listen deeper, to be open to what equitable and just public safety might look like. This is why I'm asking the council to be curious about the state of demands, to consider their implications in full, to educate yourselves on the full breadth of these topics. Thank you for your time. I'm looking forward to working together with you in this and our quest to make Montpelier a safe, welcoming city for all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lauren. Um, Allison Burns, you are up next. Hi, I'm Allison Burns and I live in East Montpelier. I'm a parent to a toddler who attends a daycare center in Montpelier and I'm also a teacher at U32. I'm here again tonight to call on city council to take concrete actions that move us towards abolishing the police. We have heard again and again from people of color who stand up at protests and rallies in the state house to share their stories about how they do not feel safe or welcome in Vermont. They have demanded that we abolish the police and I'm here again to ask you to listen to those demands. To think the changes we are making is enough is to ignore the lived experience of so many people of color in our community. City Council must defund the police and instead demonstrate a serious commitment to defunding the police and using that money to fund social services, including but not limited to affordable housing and childcare, healthcare and food, food security. I'd like to draw a comparison between our demands of policing and the abolition of schools. We know that our country is built on white supremacy and so our schools are entrenched in white supremacist ideas and values. We can see this in standardized tests, discipline policies, access to technology, hiring policies and on and on. When the pandemic first caused schools to close around the country in March, we suddenly took actions as a nation that worked towards abolishing schools as we know them today. Suddenly, all students were given computers to take home when previously not all schools provided that technology. We have known that providing access to technology at home is essential in allowing all students to succeed at school, and yet we were told that was impossible for years. And then in an instant, it was. Suddenly, standardized tests were eliminated. We have known for decades that standardized tests are based in white supremacy and racist, and yet we continue to be told how crucial they are to the success of schools. But in an instant, they were gone. The pandemic made it so clear that there were no reasons for those racist policies other than to further perpetuate white supremacy. We were told those demands were impossible, and yet we all saw that they were possible in an instant. I'd also like to comment on the SRL. In the report on page 12, it said, the SRL program is absolutely critical in meeting this pillar. SROs will facilitate conversations to continue exposure and building bridges with the very conscious and active youth in the community. They can be vital leaders in guiding restorative justice programs. An SRO cannot be part of a true restorative justice program. U32 is a great model of how a school can successfully implement a restorative justice program that transforms the school and the school community. They do not have an SRO and have been able to successfully eliminate tr detention, traditional school discipline consequences that are all based on white supremacy, which would only be possible without an SRO presence. The demands we are making may seem like impossible asks. After all, with a country built in white supremacy, we must actively work very hard to imagine our world without those racist values and ideals. We have seen, as with schools in the spring, that it is possible to make swift and sweeping changes quickly. That's why I'm calling on the city council to defund the police and reallocate those funds to community-based programs. I look forward to and I'm committed to continuing to work with you all to defund the police. 
Thanks for your time. Thank you. Uh, Carolyn. Hi, my name is Carolyn Wesley. I'm a resident of Montpelier. Uh, I'm guessing that one area of common ground I have with those attending the meeting who have dedicated their lives to law enforcement is that I value the idea of public safety. We all share a basic human desire to feel safe and protected, and I want that to be true for every resident of Montpelier. Unfortunately, as events of the last week, months, and 200 plus years continue to make clear for some communities, particularly Black communities, police don't contribute to their sense of safety. In fact, they make them feel less safe, even frightened for their lives. And this is just as true here in Vermont and Montpelier as it is anywhere in our nation. I've never personally felt threatened by the presence of a Montpelier police, uh, police officer. The continuation of policing in this community as it has been wouldn't harm me. In fact, it would likely benefit me. But I can't support a system that promotes safety for some at the expense of people of color, immigrants, those in mental health crisis, the homeless, and others who feel less safe as a result of our current system of policing. Given this fundamental flaw in our current structure for promoting public safety, we are called to restructure and think about different ways to be in community with one another. I appreciate the recognition that we need to dream bigger. I echo the demands and actions shared with you via email by a multiracial group from Montpelier residents as a good place to start. More broadly, a foundational aspect of building a safe community for all is ensuring that needs are met uh, and that funding goes to things like affordable housing, food security, health, and education. The items discussed earlier this evening, including resources for the homeless population and a new social worker position, could also be steps in the right direction. And I, I recognize the work that the council is already undertaking. I thank you for your time, consideration, and action. And I remind you that the daily deliberation of bodies like this one are how structural racism is either maintained or dismantled over time. And I thank you for taking steps in the direction of justice. Thank you. Um, Isla. Hi, thank you for having me. My name is Isla Bristol and I'm a preschool teacher and a woman of color who lives in Montpelier. Montpelier has been a major landmark in my life since I was seven years old, a place that I visited almost daily growing up and where I've chosen in my adulthood to reside. It is a city of great merit and beauty that I love dearly, but it is also an, an imperfect city with undeniable room for growth and development. Though many may convince themselves otherwise, changes must be made in order to create a comfortable environment for all who live here and all who visit. I envision a Montpelier that sets a standard for the rest of the United States by prioritizing social services over policing. And I envision a Montpelier that models safety and consideration for communities of color. I'm concerned about our city's reliance on the police and how this affects feelings of peace for people of color in Vermont. I have attended multiple Black Lives Matter protests and rallies in the past few months, and one message rang clear throughout. People of color do not feel safe around the police, and too many have firsthand accounts of when police in Vermont have not only failed them, but made them feel endangered or othered. In order to make our state's capital a safer, more hospitable, more just place, we must defund the police and reallocate the funds to causes and services that directly support communities, such as affordable housing and health care, quality education, and economic empowerment for working people. That is why I am calling on the City Council to meet the demands outlined by a group of Montpelier residents and others, which Sean Stevens enumerated and which Council members have received. This city rests within a nation that has been plagued by systemic racism and oppression since its conception. And as such, while the disenfranchised fight for the arc of American morals to bend towards righteousness, the city also lies in the midst of a national movement that is calling for justice and action in the name of the countless black people and people of color who have suffered at the hands of the police and the white supremacy upon which policing is built. After all, the first U.S. City Police Department was a slave patrol, and the racism in this origin story has only evolved over time rather than being eradicated. As a mixed race woman, I live in fear of a day where I may be racially targeted by the police, just as so many of my friends of color have been. As a preschool teacher, I know the constant desperation and stress that stems from working in a severely underfunded field, and I grapple daily with the knowledge of how much our children would thrive if budgeting was redirected towards education. As an ally in the Black Lives Matter movement, I cannot sit idly by knowing that black men and boys in this country are two and a half times more likely than white men and boys to die during an encounter with police. 
the American Public Health Association has declared police violence a public health issue, but this is not a new problem. The institution of policing is rooted in toxicity, leading to cancerous effects on this nation's people. That is why I'm calling on the city council to meet the demands that residents of Montpelier and surrounding towns have compiled. By meeting these demands, you will be communicating that communities of color are truly welcome here, bringing Montpelier ever closer to true greatness for all. Thank you for your time. We shall continue to push Montpelier towards authentic racial justice, and I encourage you all to join us. Thank you. Um, Cameron, how are we doing on a um, list of folks? I've like got um, David Hershey, Constantinos, and Stephanie. Okay, um, David uh, Hershey, you are up. Hi, I'm David Hershey. I live in East Montpelier. I am a middle school social studies teacher at Waits River Valley School, which is in Upton. And uh, my son goes to daycare in Montpelier. Um, and I'm here to echo the, the voice of the people who've spoken before me um, and the demands of those people as well. I just wanted to add, um, in looking at the new data that just came out showing the racial disparities in Vermont traffic stops and how they haven't improved, and in some cases have gotten much worse. Chief Pete did point out um, that Montpelier does not disproportionately stop or charge people of color, but just because black people aren't ticketed or arrested more in Montpelier doesn't necessarily show that stops are unbiased. Other reasons for stops like equipment issues also contribute to the feeling of being unsafe within our city. And that's all I have to add. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Constantinos. Constantinos, are you? Uh, oh, you're there. Okay. I just had to put the baby away. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. <laughs> okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Constantinos Savaros, and I'm a resident of District 2. Uh, I'd like to thank Chief Pete for his uh, thoughtful presentation that clearly took into account uh, what, what he's been hearing from, from a lot of people in the community. Uh, but we, we disagree with some of his proposed solutions, uh, specifically like body cameras or ineffective trainings. Uh, for me, I'm professionally, I'm a performance auditor specializing in government operations. Uh, I also work as a professional uh, excuse me, police misconduct uh, investigator and received many of the same use of force and bias trainings alongside NYPD members. Uh, I even underwent a month-long police policy and procedures training as well as investigations training conducted by the New York Police Department's Internal Affairs Bureau. I even graduated from one of the civilian, civilian police academies that the chief is supporting. Um, but for me, the funding towards the goal of abolition is not new. I've been involved with these issues for over a decade. For me, this isn't about just the recent public outcry. We're at a unique point in history when the public policy, when the public and policymakers like you are especially receptive, uh, excuse me, uh, a little shaken up from the day before, <laughs> uh, to imagining a future that doesn't look uh, that doesn't have to look like today, uh, to a future society where we abolish the police and prisons and other violent institutions and live in communities that are actually safe because our needs are met. Uh, because funding goes to things like affordable housing, health services, education, and food security. And, you know, this is going to be a long road. It's a really intersectional issue, but I really believe that we can do this together as a community and be a model for other communities going forward. And that's why I'm calling for the City Council to take steps to fund the Montpelier Police Department as per the demands that were emailed to you and listed by Sean earlier. Uh, as a police misconduct investigator, I spoke with hundreds, possibly thousands, of victims and witnesses of uh, police violence, many of whom had violence such as hair ripped from their scalp or being slammed on a police car hard enough to almost cause a miscarriage, be deemed as justified use of force, when clearly that kind of violence was excessive and malicious, even if it was allowed by the patrol guide or other law. We shouldn't have to parade out stories of trauma caused by police like you've asked us to in order to convince you that preserving the life and dignity of another human being is a worthwhile goal. We've made comments previously in this venue and others, and I'm concerned that we're being heard but not necessarily listened to. We're again demanding that no additional municipal funds be put towards the police department and that the police department be gradually defunded with the goal of eventual abolition. We demand funding and resources be diverted away from the police department so we can invest in things that actually make our community safer. For example, one of our demands is to ban the use of prison labor and contracts with DOC. And notice I didn't say grants because I know grants fund a lot of the community justice center. Um, so doing this will actually ensure that the municipality is not complicit in the prison industrial complex and supporting other violent and oppressive institutions that policing is part of. Um, so I'm looking forward to engaging with you in more substantive discussions on this during the new budget process beginning next month. And, you know, that's what I had prepared, but, you know, new developments over the past couple of days, I'm kind of going off script here. And, uh, you know, last night in Wisconsin, there were armed fascists and they were given water by law enforcement and thanked for their service for showing up to that protest. Shortly afterwards, one of them, Kyle Rittenhouse, 
shot indiscriminately into a crowd of anti-racists, while the police just stood by and did nothing, resulting in the murder of at least two protesters. Just a few weeks ago, here, in Montpelier, armed white supremacists were at the State House, saying black lives don't matter. Patriot front stickers are showing up in our downtown. Black Lives Matter um, signs are being defaced and vandalized. You know, Kyle Rittenhouse is not a lone wolf, lone wolf, and there are people just like him right here in Vermont. We've seen them. Their supporters even spoke earlier at this very meeting. Given Chief Pete's emphasis on officer morale and mental health and his use of Blue Lives Matter languages in the report over the prioritization of the safety of our community, I currently have little confidence in the police department keeping us safe from these violent fascists in our midst. At some point, I'd like to hear from Chief Pete how he expects his officers to respond when armed vigilantes are threatening and intimidating people in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Stephanie. I am here, and before I forget, well, okay. Before I forget, I just want to say that there is someone on the phone, Alicia Glover, who wants to speak, and I, I'm not sure if she was able to raise her hand. But, Thanks for the heads up. Okay, cool. So, uh, first of all, I give you guys credit for having to listen first to people who are denying the meaning of Black Lives Matter, and then to hear from us, who are ultimately seeking to abolish policing. So, you guys are all patient souls, and I do appreciate that. <laughs> Um, my name is Stephanie Gomery and I live in Montpelier. I work in town as well and I'm also the parent of a toddler. I also am calling on us to defund the Montpelier police and you can find that full list of demands in the email that we referenced. Look, I get why Chief Pete isn't for defunding the police. It's his job to lead a police department and Chief Pete is doing his job. While I take issue with some of the things in his new report, I know he stepped up and that he's listening. Here's what I can't wrap my head around though. It's a hesitation on the part of the city council to take these steps. To get the money to invest in housing, food security, economic empowerment, and other social programs to make Montpelier better, why would you hesitate to start in a department that the public is insisting is not ultimately good for all the community? Now is our chance to examine what the police department is using all of its funding for, every last cent, and to figure out how we can divert funding away to start the critical work needed to make all of our systems work better for everyone. And I just wanted to backtrack a bit, because our ultimate goal here is to address society-wide inequities to improve people's lives in Montpelier. And problems of policing are just a symptom of a much wider problem, which is systemic racism. But there's a reason we're focused on the police in particular. I was thinking a lot about this. Think about why all of our systems are racist. They're racist because they deprive people of positive things. The education system is racist because communities of color are deprived of well-resourced schools. The healthcare system is racist because people of color are routinely denied adequate care. The housing system is racist because generations of land theft, followed by decades of redlining, have deprived black people in particular of affordable homes and of the opportunity to build equity and wealth. Education, healthcare, and housing are good things that all people deserve. The way these systems are racist is through depriving certain people of these good things. And yet policing, policing is different. It, policing in America was designed to keep black people in their place. Policing is generally not kind to poor people, to women, to trans people, and to so many others. I'm not saying that cops never help anyone from these groups. I'm saying that the system of policing is not inherently good the way education, healthcare, housing, and other social services are, or at least can be. Education, healthcare, and housing are human rights. Policing is not a human right. In fact, it so often violates human rights. So logically, wouldn't policing be something we'd want to scrutinize first as we work on fixing the inequities in our other systems? Obviously, none of this is going to happen overnight, and that is okay. I just want a commitment from you, the city council, that it will happen. I don't want to raise my child in a place that is brave enough to emblazon Black Lives Matter on its main thoroughfare, yet is not committed to doing anything more substantial to reduce the effects of systemic racism on the people in this city. And that includes white people, by the way. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, Cameron. I just want to note, if you are on a phone and you are dialing in only, you hit star six to unmute or star nine to raise your hand. Um, so I want to make sure that the folks on the phone know how to, to speak up. Thank you. And uh, with the heads up that uh, Alicia Glover uh, wanted to speak, Alicia, do you want to, um, if you're on, do you, would you like to say something? Hi, this is Lisa Glover. I'm just checking in that I'm effectively unmuted. Yes, we can hear you. 
Okay, super. So thank you. Thank you for that feedback. And I haven't had the opportunity to see anything that's been put up on the screen for this call, but I've, I've been listening to, um, you know, everything, everything that's been brought forward. Um, and, uh, and jumping in at this point, because this is, this is the point that I was invited to do so, um, for this meeting. Um, I, uh, I, again, I'm incredibly fascinated. I'm very new to the Montpelier community as of as of about a year, and uh, also just as a as a bit of an introduction, I have uh, family members that have served on city can council for many years, and uh, been very involved in previous communities that I've been a part of. Um, I recently ended up in a situation with the Montpelier police and uh, have actually been in, in contact with the police department as, as well as, um, you know, the mayor regarding this and uh, just, just trying to understand um, what policing policy is in Montpelier and, and what our rights are as, as civilians because, um, well, I like to think of myself as representing many colors, I would primarily be identified as, as a white person. Um, so again, not, not necessarily racial issues here. Um, the department represented to me that perhaps being a woman may have, have had an undercurrent in my interaction with the police department. Um, but I do have a little, little bit of a concern as, as just a citizen of the Montpelier community in, in an interaction that I, within the last couple of weeks, had with the police department and uh, had some questions that I reached out to the community about um, to understand because, you know, I felt that I was attempting to cooperate with the police department and um, in good faith that I don't feel like that good faith was returned by the police police department. So um, again, I'm, I'm jumping in into this and listening to what the community has to say and everyone has to say regarding this and have certainly found myself in a different place because again, I have a tremendous amount of respect for, for police departments in general and have many, many friends that have, have served in that way. Um, so understanding what their roles have been and yet found myself in a situation where what their roles were were not appropriate for the situation that I was in. So, so um, my jumping into this conversation is just to encourage. I, I really appreciated hearing all of the testimonies and, and things from the from the community, and uh, certainly suggest having a deep look at this and making appropriate transitions over time um, towards towards some better things and it sounds like there's certainly some areas that, that the police department has had oversight of that might be better delegated to some other organizations with a different skill set. There's also probably some things that uh, it's time to go ahead and update training procedures to make more appropriate and or hand off those responsibilities to once again organizations that are better able to deal with that. Um, because again, my situation ended up creating some, some difficulty for me personally um, in relationship to the police department and uh, my trust of the police department in general. Um, yeah, so again, this is this is me shooting from the heart without without very much specifically prepared, but wanted to go ahead and add that from the perspective of a new person in the community um, who's really super open to listening to what the community has to say in the direction that it wants to take, but just going ahead and sharing a quite recent experience that that I had. Right. Thank you, Alicia. For Alicia. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Yep. Um, uh, uh, Cameron, where are we at? Um, I've got Shana Casper. And if anyone else is interested in speaking, raise your hand in the Zoom function or in person. So we have um, your name on there is Irwin. Irwin? After Shana. Okay. Um, all right, Shana, you're up. All right, thanks. Um, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, my name's Shana Casper. I live on Kent Street, Montpelier. Um, and I just want to speak directly to the question that Connor asked about 
having the police directly report to the city council and any lobbying efforts. Um, I had to be on a call, another call for work um, from about 6.50 to about 9.15. So I'm sorry that I missed all of really the important presentation and a lot of the discussion, but you know, glad that I could rejoin for this final conversation here at the end. Um, I also just happen to be a member, uh, uh, the chair of the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee, but I am here in my personal capacity. Um, and I, but I am on this committee and I want to speak about policing today because I recognize the historic and ongoing systems and structures of our, our nation, our state, our community, and how they perpetuate racist, sexist, heterosexist, classist, ableist, and other forms of injustice and oppression. Um, and I want to reshape the systems and policies and practices that perpetuate these barriers to equity and justice in our community. Um, and changing policing is just one piece of, of this larger puzzle to make Montpelier a more equitable, just, and welcoming place. Um, and that's why I'm you know, calling on the city council to you know, heed the demands that Sean stated, specifically wanting to speak to having the police department directly report their lobby, uh, any lobbying or, or um, a state house efforts to the city council. This you know, would really give the city council an opportunity to ask questions directly about this activity. Um, and as you all know, you know, being the, the state's um, capital city, our government officials are often called on to speak to the legislature on their perspectives. And um, while these actions may be you know, indirectly reported to the city council, in an effort of transparency, I think that direct and detailed reporting of any and all lobbying and statehouse activity by Montpelier police should be you know, reported directly to the city council particularly important in this moment in the response to you know local and state and national conversations around policing that are happening as you all know you know organizations including the aclu migrant uh migrant justice justice for all outright vermont pride center rights and democracy naacp bbsr from vcil um criminal justice reform human rights commission legal aid vperg um, and for, uh, Women's Justice and Freedom Initiative have brought forward a police reform agenda, um, which if you haven't seen, I can, I can circulate to the committee afterwards if that'd be helpful. And the state will likely you know, take action um, that will affect our policing here in Montpelier in the coming months. Uh, and so I anticipate that the Montpelier police will be called on to share their perspectives. And I think that the city council and the public has a, a right to know uh, more about what this, what and why this is. And this is, you know, I think just a really easy and necessary first step um, to hold our police to, you know, a, a higher level of transparency um, and accountability um, to, to the public. Um, so thank you so much for your time and for your work on this important issue. And I look forward to continue to work together on this and the other um, things that Sean noted before. Thank you. All right. Um, Irvin. And or. Hi, my name's my name's Rebecca Dalgan. I'm sorry, you can't see the rest of the name on there. Um, uh, I, I live in Montpelier in District One. Um, I um, wasn't planning to speak, but I felt um, compelled to um, just. Uh, I was really impressed to hear hear the demands that um, Sean read out that that group came up with, and not part of that group, but um, they seem to address um, a lot of. A, a lot of the concerns that uh, I've been hearing were over the past few months, even though I know those concerns have been there for a long time. Um, and then just, um, t you know, over the past few months, we um, have had BIPOC on our house lawn at the state house demanding, demanding these things, and I'm not sure how we can stop and really, really listen and do the work that needs to be done and really take a deep look and, and bold action um, to to change our system. Um, I I think that um, as as other folks have mentioned, that that policing is rooted in oppression and slavery, and I'm not sure how you can take that and turn it, um, you know, just reform it without more more. Um, bold changes um just something that's really going to um be something where everyone in our community feels safe um and where um you know all of our needs as a community and individual are being met um so i think um i think i'll leave it at that i just would urge the city council um, and i would say um 
I'd really like to see, see you move on um, on those um, demands for for real real change. Um, and thank you all for your for your work and time and um, being here. Thank you, um, Rebecca. You were kind of breaking up there a little bit, and um, I think I heard most of what you said. But I would invite you to submit some written comments as well, just so that we can be sure that we've that we've heard you. Um, Thanks, uh, Donna. Did you, was that what you were going to say? I didn't get her last name too. I couldn't hear her, and I didn't get your last name, Rebecca. Could I have it, please? Yes, uh, Dalgan. Okay. Okay. Thank I'll you. change it on the name. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Cameron, checking in with you. I don't have anyone else raising their hand. Um, now is the time if you'd like to. If, if I may say something in response. Oh, absolutely. Go ahead, Chief. Um, I'm extremely appreciative of, of everyone for making their concerns made, uh, noted. And, and that's one of the things that I admire most about being part of this community. My hope is to have these conversations, these dialogues, because this is not a simple issue. My, the things that are going on within policing are rooted, just like you know, you could say policing is rooted in racism, this country is rooted in racism. So do you abolish the country for it? So there's, this is a very, very complex topic. And I think that very fact means that rush decisions can't be made for something like this. They're complex. And while I've heard consecutively what's happening in Kenosha, what's happening in, in Chicago, what's happening in New York, I haven't heard what's happening in Montpelier. Um, so I don't know the full story of what happened in other places. I can't speak to those things. I can tell you that I understand the problems with policing. So stepping away from being a police person and moving into the shoes of the qualifier of saying I'm a black or a person of color. I grew up on the south side of Chicago. I've been there to see good things happen in policing and schooling and any other institution we want to name, as well as, you know, the, the good and the bad and everything. And I can tell you without a doubt, if I saw something in the Montpelier Police Department that gave me concern, I would be the first one to say so, and I'd be the first one to break it up and do everything in my power to break that up. So in the educating oneself about uh, of th those fundamental things, the fact that everyone has had different lived experiences in relation to this, further emphasizes the fact of how complex this is. And to have, we have to have these conversations. We have to talk about responsible next steps in doing these things. And that means I, I've put myself out there and I will continue to put myself out there. I've asked for people to talk to me, to reach me. I've met with people on front porches. I've met with people at the Statehouse Lawn. I've met with people on Zoom. So, so folks that have complaints or comments or anything that have negative experiences, I need to know about those so I can deal with those and handle those. So with these multiple sides, with the understanding that this is a complex problem, um, and, and in response to one of the questions that was posed directly to me, how could I deal with armed vigilantes, I can't deal with them if I don't have a police force because it's been abolished. So with things that have happened in places, in, in like schools with SRO programs, I understand that there are apprehensions that, uh, that police stress people out. I get stressed out when I get pulled over. It's just the nature of what happens. But the, the, what we have to do is make sure that we, that, that we control what we can control here in Montpelier. So, there are, I'm not advocating that police officers are counselors, school counselors, that they're disciplinarians. I'm advocating quite against it. Part of this is also an, uh, an educational campaign with the public. How many calls of services are we getting from people who are complaining about loud noises from the neighbors that officers with large guns have to show up to deal with the situation? So, so there's an educational part on both sides, which is why this conversation is extremely crucial. And I'm ready to have those tough conversations. I'm ready to be honest and blunt in those conversations and accept that criticism that comes back to me. So within schools, yes, this is Montpelier. Yes, it is a safe community, but drugs still happen. Domestic violence, unfortunately, still happens. Sexual assault still happens. And we don't 
tell people about those things because they're personal to the people that they happen to, especially when they happen in the schools, especially when you're talking about human trafficking, especially when you're talking about addiction problems. They're there. They exist. And somebody has to respond to them. So I am, yes, advocating that police officers should not be drug counsels, counselors, but they should be, they should understand what they're responding to so they can be empathetic and, and, and help people who need who need our services and need our help for a, a multi-pronged um, um, response to these crises. So again, uh, I, I want to acknowledge and thank I'm not belittling anybody's points or perspectives, but I'm amplifying that the fact that there are so many of them means that this is a complex problem and a simple solution um, will not handle it because there are going to be unintended consequences that are going to that jeopardize every institution that we have. And so I'm, I'm staying ready to have these conversations with folks. I implore people to come talk to me. I will come to you. Let's talk about it. Let's figure out the best ways we can all do this. Great. Thank you, Chief. So um, I actually wrote out some thoughts um, about this, and so I'm, I, I don't normally like read comments, but I'm, I wrote out some thoughts about this. So uh, I'm going to take the privilege to, to jump in here first. Um, and by the way, I just want to acknowledge the time. Um, thank you all for hanging in there. I'm sorry it's late. Um, are you, your counsel, are you okay for a little bit? Are you? You're okay? Okay. Just, I mean, yeah. Thanks for hanging in there. Um, okay. So, uh, first of all, uh, I want to thank Chief Pete for taking a significant amount of time to talk with our community in a variety of venues over multiple days about policing in Montpelier. His report and analysis of the department was insightful and reflective of the conversations uh, he's had with the department and outside of it. I'm thankful that our chief also took a position of, of listening upon taking over leadership of the department. And I know our community and our department will both be better for his thoughtfulness. Uh, I'm excited about the many ideas and suggestions that the chief has presented in his analysis, uh, which if you haven't had a chance to check out, I would highly recommend. Um, there's a lot of um, really interesting uh, proposals in there. Uh, many of those, uh, I think, will position Montpelier as a leader for good policing practices. And I love the idea of like a citizen's academy in which uh, community members can get to know at a deeper level what's involved in policing. I love the idea of a strategic planning board for the department. Uh, this puts the department in alignment with the Parks Department and the Senior Center, which both have their own boards that help advise the department. The, the, rea the reality <laughs> is that the City Council is not well structured to dive deeply into complex to topics like policing. Um, and any time a deep dive or a protracted conversation is necessary about it, any topic, we often end up creating a working group or a committee so that they can spend the necessary time to get into the details and come back to us, the council, with um, any recommendations. So a strategic planning group uh, will, be, uh, will be able to go deep on policing issues look at data, look at best practices, and make recommendations that take all this into account and reflect the values of our community. So in a time when so many police departments' data demonstrates racial disparities, the fact that our race-related data shows that we are not stopping Black people any more often than they are present in the population, that is remarkable. Uh, that's clearly the work of years of training and dedication to preventing racist outcomes. I, I don't want to let that go without mention. Uh, that, so yeah, my, my hat is off to the police department. Uh, thank you for your dedication and commitment to serving our community. I would, so go, I would go so far as to say that this kind of data is so unusual that it is worth examining how we got to this point. I know uh, we already thanked Chief Fakus for his years of service when he retired a couple months ago, but it bears repeating. Kudos uh, to our former Chief Fakus who led the department for so many years and built this professional police culture. Uh, having said that, I think the suggestions from Chief Pete are spot on and will make us even better. Um, I look forward to working further with the Chief and with the community uh, to implement um, this vision for the department. Um, so. That's uh, at least what I 
wanted to say about all this and and even too with you know the suggestions from uh, the community that we got this evening you know happy to talk like let's let's dig in um so uh unfortunately at 10 o'clock it's um you know tough to do that deeply now but um but the future is a big place and, and let's talk about it um so that's that's it for me other thoughts or comments uh jack Hi, I wasn't sure I was going to be first, but I do have some thoughts. I uh, appreciate uh, the fact that we're at the, really at the very beginning of, uh, of a process of uh, thinking about what we want police to be like in Montpelier. Um, my overall uh, thought about this, I, I really appreciate the Chief's uh, report and recommendations. I think it is... Uh, it's a great uh, snapshot of how the city police department is working and, and where we can be going. Um, it helps to inform my overview of where we are now, which is that I do not think the city of Montpelier is over policed. I do not think it's realistic to uh, think we're going to abolish uh, the Montpelier Police Department. Um, I found it very uh, thought-provoking when uh, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was asked, well, what does it mean? How can you imagine what, it, what happens when we defund the police department? And her response was, well, it's already out there. Look at what the police departments in uh, suburban towns do now. And I think that if we uh, compare her model of what those towns do and what uh, in responding to police type uh, issues, it's really very close to what the Montpelier City Police is already doing. And, and places that have problems with, uh, with police, and there are plenty of them, would... Uh, would love to have the uh, the police uh, force and philosophy that we have here. Um, I do think there are a number of issues that uh, that we should be uh, working on. A lot of these are are really covered very well with uh, in the chief's report. First, we need to know what we're doing now, right and wrong. The traffic stop data was really very encouraging. You know, I, I read the reports about what's happening or the news coverage of the report about what's happening statewide. And uh, it's great to see how well uh, our force, our police force is doing in terms of uh, racial bias. I think we should be uh, collecting in terms of figuring out what, what we're doing now. I think we should you, uh, collect the same kind of, uh, of data for other interactions between the police and members of the compute community. Maybe we already do, but I think that is something that we should be looking at. I support the idea of uh, body cameras. I recognize that there's a risk of uh, misuse of the uh, information that comes from them, but uh, I think it also helps to, dem uh, to document what is being done wrong and right by the police. Um, and as in the public debate about body cameras and the state legislation about body cameras, one of the things that I think we should be advocating for is uh, having uh, mandatory body cams all across the police departments in Vermont and have, uh, have the storage of uh, body cam data be, uh, be a state function rather than imposing that on all the little police departments all across the state. And the third in the, or last in this uh, topic, I think we should do uh, use of force reporting. Um, second, we need to be, uh, to beef up our efforts to protect people's rights, including review of all uses of force and not only a citizen 
the advisory board, which I think we should have, but also a civilian review board of uh, complaints of police misconduct. I appreciate the chief's confidence in the city council when he says that we already have civilian oversight of the uh, police department, but we don't, and we can't effectively work as a, as a city council to uh, review individual complaints uh, as they're brought to uh, brought up for police interaction. So I think a civilian review board with uh, subpoena power is something we should be looking at. Um, I think uh, we should be police policies. We should be uh, there. We've made progress. I'm not sure if all the policies are on, on the web page yet, but I know they're on the way if they're not. And I think we should uh, probably have a public and stated uh, interval for reviewing of all of our policies. Um, I support the chief's uh, ideas about recruiting and training. Uh, I've been attending a series of seminars that I think I was probably invited to by the chief, uh, uh, carried out by Dr. Nwoye. And uh, the last one, which was last week, I think, was all about training. And uh, I was really struck by the other police officials who were in this uh, call, and it's all, all across the country, and even outside the country, I think. Uh, about the receptiveness of other police uh, officials to get training away from the uh, military style training that we've uh, seen for years. I thought that was that was great to hear. I, I've taught at the police academy and it's it's just weird. It's not normal. <laughs> and so we that that is an important thing that needs to uh, to be addressed. Um, I think we should be looking at uh, police liability for uh, misconduct. I think qualified immunity is a big problem, and there, there are different ideas of how to address that. I know I'm a, a city official. This is potentially opening the city up for uh, for liability. But if uh, if the people who work for us do uh, do violence without justification. Um, we should be liable for uh, for what they do. Um, I do think we uh, should ex be exploring the uh, the role of the school resource officer. I uh, I've never had, even though I've had two sons who went through uh, the entire public school system in Montpelier. I've never had any contact uh, through that with the school resource officers who uh, who've been in the schools um, so I don't have a great understanding of what the school resource officer does I do think uh, I understand that a lot of people think there's they've gotten a lot of value from school resource officers um, and I I don't doubt that that's true I do think it's worth exploring the question of whether um, the services provided by a school resource officer need to be uh, provided by a police officer. And that is part of the bigger question of what should the police be doing and what can be done by uh, other entities. Good to see Gary Gordon in here. Gary and I go back 25 or 30 years in, uh, in our work lives. And so uh, obviously, uh, well, I have had a lot more, con my clients have had a lot more contact with Washington County Mental Health and the screeners than with, uh, with the police. But uh, I think having the, uh, having the social work associate worker associated with the, uh, with the police is gonna be, uh, is gonna be a great step forward. And I think that's a good start. I think there's, there's a lot to do, but I think that uh, Montpelier and the Montpelier police are uh, are in a good good place to start from. Thanks. Thank you. Other thoughts or comments? Uh, uh, Dan, then Donna, then Lauren. Thanks. Um, I'll try and keep my thoughts somewhat succinct. There's, but there's a few of them. 
I guess I'd start with one of the points that I think a number of speakers have made, and I think it fundamentally affects the way we view this process. And I think one of the speakers actually put it quite quite well, um, which was about the historic origins of policing. Um, I would push back in the research that I've, I've done, and my understanding is that yes, policing has an element of racism, particularly from the South um, and the fugitive slave uh, laws, the, the posses that were assembled. But there's another strain of policing uh, history that deals with the night watch and the New England tradition of policing um, that was very much based around the idea of community service and protecting the community um, not from any particular group or class, but just simply as a function of um, the way in which the world works, that there are uh, a need to make sure that there's peace and tranquility in, in the village. Um, and that is not necessarily, that is not an, a, a racist history. Um, it is certainly one of how civil society ha has evolved. Uh, that's not to say um, that we can stand here in Vermont and say we're free from uh, racism, uh, but it is to say that there are other strains and there are other sources to that. And I think it's important to think about that because, you know, some of those issues do hold for us today. Um, you know, the idea of a police department as a first responder um, to ensure peace and tranquility, to serve and protect. Those are important values and those are important needs um, that we as a community have long held. Um, and how we do that is important and how we ensure that in doing that, we do not um, fall into some of the issues that have been raised tonight. But the idea that it is a blanket um, one source origin, I, I think is, is incorrect. And I think it's more nuanced than that. And I would encourage us as we talk about this to consider that, you know, and consider the English constable, the constable history that has informed that, that this, these are members of our community. Uh, and I think that's reflected also in some of the thinking, um, you know, that, that some of the books, uh, my grandmother's hands that talks about um, the role of, of community policing, which goes back to that night watch, because of course the night watch were, were members of, the community that were volunteers, um, they may not have been uh, the best night watchmen falling asleep or perhaps indulging in mead or cider. Um, but at the same time, they it was this idea that the community um, served itself, protected itself, ensured its peace and tranquility. Um, and those kind of elements that I think we have to, we have to think about because I think they are important as touchstones um, to how we see community policing coming around, because that's really coming back to that idea that we have members of the community that we have uh, that are, are members of the police force that are serving and protecting all of us, um, for, you know, whether we're Montpelier residents, regardless of whatever our color, race, gender, uh, identity, um, or and visitors as well. Um, and I think that, um, you know, there is a legitimate purpose for that. The second point is that I think we have to engage with each and every one of these issues in a thoughtful process, which is to say, uh, we could take an example and I'll just take the corrections contracts that I, I think Bill are, are the only, is the only correction contract we've used for a cemetery uh, mowing? That's correct. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, I think that's that's actually it's that's one of those interesting things that, you know, we haven't used it this year. And I was a cemetery commissioner for years. And, you know, it's certainly it's actually not a policing issue. It's it's more of a do we do we um, promote that particular type of of labor? And I, there's certainly unfairness in it. There's, you know, the uh, rise of the questioning of the 13th Amendment um, issues within that. But at this at the same time you know, it was seen as a cost savings for the city and for the residents. And, um, but here we are in the summer without mowing our cemetery and people are talking about how great it is. Um, and, you know, is there, is there a way that it's, it, 
we rethink that. I, I think absolutely. But it's looking through, you know, why did we have this decision in the first place to use this? What are the effects of change? Um, and what are the values? And balancing those things and not just simply saying, well, it's a no-brainer. We can simply adopt this. I, I don't think that any of these, and I'm echoing some of the other speakers, I don't think any of these changes are necessarily that easy, that straightforward, that no-brainer, um, that they require at least some vetting, some review, some thought process to go through. And I think that's a lot of what Chief Pete has started tonight um, in his report, and I think that's what we continue. Um, I want to, the next, I want to re respond in a little bit to the idea of um, our place as being different. And this is a little bit of what the mayor talked upon. Uh, one of the speakers talked about the rosy, rosy Vermont exceptionalism, which I thought was a great phrase. Um, but, you know, the fact is, is that we are different. And this is a different community with different issues, with different strengths, different weaknesses, different um, challenges. Um, and if we do ignore um, our local needs to, um, to tie into some of these national issues, I think we do ourselves a disservice. One of the great pleasures of serving on a city council or serving at the local level is the ability to focus on these local issues, these, uh, these issues that sit within our, our boundaries and, and to adopt and to develop practices and to develop um, you know, protocols or, or systems that really serve our community um, and help us to be better than we are and to become closer to the best, to bend our arcs towards justice and the other values that we hold. And so I think, you know, we can't ignore the fact that we have these differences and that some of our challenges may be under a different guise. Um, and so I think we, it's not necessarily Vermont exceptionalism because I, I, I don't think, you know, look, I, I, I grew up Catholic, so I don't think anything's that great. Uh, we're all we're all sinners, um, but you know this is, and we have to continue to work, and we have to continue to strive. And so that's you know I, I think by but by we strive in different ways. The the next thing I want to talk about is uh, in response is some of some of the concepts that are being thrown forward. I think we have to think in concrete terms. And there's a lot of abstract concepts that are floating around. And, you know, like the student resource officer in some ways becomes a very abstract concept. And I think some of the commentators have, have really done, uh, some of the city councilors have responded in, in um, thoughtful ways. And I think a lot of the commentators have provided a lot of details. And I think Chief Pete has provided some, some counterpoints to that as well, which are that a, a student resource officer is not just simply a person in a school with a badge and a gun, uh, but they serve multiple functions. and you know, they do do good work for some people. And the question is always, it goes back to my first point, what role are they playing? What role have they played? What role can they play? And do those things get outweighed by other concerns and issues? And I think we just have to continue to look at that in very concrete terms, as opposed to sort of abstract ideas. Um, the fifth thing I want to point out is that a lot of the reason why we have uh, six, had successes as a department and why we have, um, you know, some of the statistics that we look at is the fact that we have put resources into the police and like anything, you know, any department, whether it be fire, police, public works, these are expensive propositions. And if we underfund them, I've really come to believe in looking at some of this information um, that we, we put at risk things that we do well by not supporting the, uh, the department as it exists. Um, and my brother is a teacher and he, he will tell me forever and ever how if you have less, you just simply do less. And he's witnessed that firsthand. I think we have to be careful regardless of the department, whether it's police, education, anything. When we make cuts, we're asking people to do more with less and we can only expect them to do less with less. And some of the professionalism that we expect out of our department, some of the thoughtfulness and uh, ideas that they, that they do provide um, come from the fact that we give them the resources. They have the ability to, um, uh, to grow in, in certain ways. And I think Chief Beef's report touches upon areas where they feel constrained. Um, and the idea is not necessarily throw 
more or less money at it, but to be thoughtful about it and give the opportunity for our department to be the thoughtful and um, best department that it can be and to improve. And that may not be a money issue. That may be um, a, either a different type of training issue, or it may be just simply how we as a community respond to either uh, oversee, support, change, uh, improve policies, um, or as I think one of the suggestions were tonight, look at our statutes. If we take away statutes that they have to enforce or ordinances that they have to enforce, that may make their job easier. That's a, that's a zero dollar proposition, um, but it can have a big improvement. And I think those things are all worth looking at, um, which I guess brings me to sort of my final point, which is, you know, I think all these ideas are welcome. All these ideas are worth considering and vetting. Uh, but again, it has to be through this process in which we do so in a thoughtful manner, which is always a slow manner. And it's tough because, you know, everybody wants me to stop talking now, but I want to make sure I make my point clearly. Um, and so it's the same way here. We, we all want change. We want change tomorrow. But we have to understand that the best way to effectuate change, change that doesn't have unintended consequences, change that's helps uh, our city continue to function as it has and improve is change that we take slowly. So that's all I have to say. Not really, but for now, at least. Thank you, Dan. Donna. Okay, well, I'll be briefer than Dan, but I will want to start. I wasn't around for night watch, Dan, but I am one of the few attending right now that old enough to participate in the 1960 protest. And we protest the war, the climate, the business, police, women rights, gay rights, and they all are cont continuously being protests. But I want to salute those who are here tonight protesting status quo and worse than status quo is actually bad action. And we need those protests and we need that energy, but I'm asking, pleading for everyone to work with us. And as Dan pointed out and many others, to make the steps to make it happen. And it's a whole community and that's part of why we funded through our social justice committee to bring in an expert and help community get involved, do a real assessment of what's going on for people in their personal lives, as well as in their interface with all the city services, is so we can all get better and that we can help our police, but help all of us in all of our services. So that's my plea is please work with us because it's good energy and I want to draw from it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lauren. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I keep coming back to uh, where the chief started saying, like, dream bigger. I love that. <laughs> um, and really grateful, really on all sides. I thought that, um, you know, the chief's report had a lot of great stuff and have really appreciated how much um, he has been out there in the community. I know I've been able to participate in a couple um, various Zoom community dialogues, uh, like a panel conversation that he convened with some experts that seemed like international experts, like a whole bunch of different ways to, to learn from and listen. And I, I think it's been great to, you know, I think sharing perspectives that might not be popular with some of the people on the call and just being really honest and sharing perspectives from um, his experience and expertise. And I really appreciate the community members being out here tonight and sharing their perspectives and thoughts and ideas. Um, you know, so I think, you know, I'm, I'm just really grateful we're having the conversation and, and taking a hard look at our whole society and all these systems, including our police department. And as Donna mentioned, you know, we've got this process that's gonna be starting with our social and economic justice advisory committee convening conversations, looking, um, you know, broadly at racial, economic uh, justice issues um, in our community. So, you know, there's going to be even more kind of holistic conversations as well. You know, I'm really hoping that we can, you know, as a council, you know, commit tonight to a process that, you know, I think the chief laid out an idea of the strategic planning committee. I think the idea of having community members, having um, 
police officials, you know, figuring out what's the right makeup of a group that could really look at that. What's, what's that bigger dream that we can come up with together? And then what are the steps we can be taking to get there? And the chief has a bunch of ideas in his plan. There's a bunch of ideas we were sent tonight. Um, you know, I think there's, it seems like there's a lot of things that we could make progress on. You know, I do, you know, totally agree. We need to be thoughtful. We need to be, you know, I want to be based in data and what will work. Um, but I think there's a lot of things that I've heard um, from both the chief and from um, community members that I think, you know, some would be easier to do and that would be harder, you know, public access to lobbying. Those are all public documents. That seems like a really easy thing to ask that we just make those easily accessible so people can see, you know, what are what, what we're lobbying on. Those are already public documents. Um, and then there's a lot more complicated ones uh, that are out there. And there's both policy questions um, that we could look at, you know, how fair and impartial policing. I think the idea that was brought up of reviewing city ordinances and, you know, where, you know, the chief mentioned mission creep, like where are we as city council putting things in ordinances and putting things on the plate of the police that don't need to be there and could be handled in different ways. You know, I think things like that are um, really interesting ideas as well. You know, and then there's a bunch of requests with budget implications. So, you know, my hope is that we could have this process, you know, I think we need to to figure out what is the right structure of community group, but maybe some, you know, the way we've handled it, sometimes I'm thinking of the homelessness task force, where we knew we needed to address an issue, we set up a group with both a short term, I think we gave them like a three month come back to us with some short term ideas, and then let us know if this group should continue meeting or if we should set up a different structure for a group. And I'm wondering if a model like that might might work for us um, so that we could have ideas that might be in time for budget season to consider um, to make progress on. Um, but I, I think this is kind of similar to where Anne started. Um, but I'm hoping that, you know, we could like figure out, okay, how do we how do we start putting in place, you know, there's a whole bunch of great ideas out there. And I think there's a lot of passion and interest. And so how do we work together as a community to, to have those dialogues we need to you know really do the hard work of figuring out okay how do we actually make this work and what will work for our community um, and then you know bring them bring them forward so that we can start making progress so that's my thought thank you Lauren thanks Connor all right I, I don't think I'm going to sound like Cicero because it's like 10 30 at night and I only have bullet points here but uh I'll just read through them um the reason I'm asking so many questions I think about the structure of the group is I don't necessarily think a venue like this is the best one to actually get all the information you need to make intelligent decisions with like two minutes of people speaking each. So having that conversations in the community is really important. And to see if there's some consensus in the group, I think is also important. You know, I, I think you hear terms like reimagining the police, which I would see like a lot of the recommendations in this re report. Um, defund the police, you know, shifting money to other areas of the budget, um, or abolish the police, which um, I, I would see is very aspirational to get to a point doing that. So I, th I think just getting some clarity of where everybody's coming from, whether that's a unified position or if that's, you know, people sort of moving in the same direction or otherwise, um, that'd be really helpful. Uh, but I do want to say, like, first off, Chief Pete, obviously you're, you're you know, the best guy for the job, if we wanted anybody who was going to listen to the community, um, you've already demonstrated that you're willing to go out and uh, actually put your thumb on the pulse of Montpelier. So that, you know, whether you agree or disagree, I, I think you're doing the work of um, going out there and soliciting the information there. And on, on the same end, you know, the activists who came today, uh, the criticism of a lot of activists is, uh, you know, some people would go to a rally and hold a sign that says defund the police or something. Um, and then there's other people who would sit through two design review hearings, you know, to get to the point where you can actually have this conversation here. So uh, hats off to you as well. It's, uh, you know, city council is a lot about potholes and not just the big headline issues there. So thanks to everybody. Um, it would be helpful for me as we look at the uh, recommendations to just identify what are in the council's jurisdiction. Uh, and which recommendations are not coming from people who testify there. Uh, an example is like the SRO position. Obviously that's gonna be, uh, we need to have a chat about that. 
does that fall uh, under the school board? Does that fall under us? Is that a joint hearing or something? So just kind of sussing that out, I think would be helpful to me. Um, something I'm going to disagree with right off the bat is collective bargaining. And, uh, you know, I, I've worked in unions all my life there, and I think it's a really slippery slope. Um, if you say some groups of people have a right to organize and other people don't, um, I, I don't think it's even legal to draw that line in the sand to say, okay, we're not going to give raises for the next three years. Uh, that's a process of give and take between an employee and an employer. And I think if we were to say that for the police, uh, what's to stop any employer from saying, you know, okay, somebody pushing a mop in city government isn't going to get a raise this year. Uh, or somebody working in public works or the fire department isn't going to get raised this year. Um, I think collective bargaining is sacred, and I, I you know, I, I think it's uh, beyond our jurisdiction uh, to, to uh, weigh in on anything like that. Similarly, to like enact a hiring freeze, I, I think it's fair to say, okay, maybe we need less positions, uh, but I don't think that's really the argument you want to make. I think if you're coming in. You probably want to say, okay, I've looked at like the staffing ratios compared to the police logs, and I don't think we need this many police on the night shift um, on this level, because otherwise it's just, you know, cost shifting to overtime or something like that. Um, so I think it's kind of a false construct to have the conversation. Um, prison labor, just like Dan, I'd like to learn more about that. I think it's pretty limited of what we use, but. Um, yeah, I could I could see that being an issue to delve into, and I'd be interested to hear more about that, even if it is like you know a cemetery contract or something. Uh, strategic advisory. Um, I'm somebody who I think has evolved over the past year into you know. I thought the social worker should be under the police department. I thought maybe the homelessness uh, liaison position should be under the police department, but. Uh, over a year of talking to people in the community, um, I, I think I've come to the point where, you know, the best person to be that front line isn't necessarily wearing a badge. And the experiences that people have had really um, sort of color w whether that person would uh, be seen as an ally or an adversary to a certain group of people. Um, similarly, like when we look at an oversight um, board or an advisory board, I guess the nature of them could be different. Um, I don't see them necessarily being housed under the MPD. I think, you know, that might, um, uh, you know, just, just, just from the public's point of view, that might be seen as like the, you know, fox guard in the hen house there or something. Uh, so I think we could talk about where that's actually housed. Is it, is it better in the community justice center? Um, somewhere else? I don't know. Right now, the city council whether we like it or not, is the entity that oversees the police department. And I agree with the mayor. Uh, we don't have the capacity to get in the weeds um, to the degree we should. I think it's very important that we call out bad behavior. I, I also think it's very important that um, we push back against things we disagree with. I, I, like Diane Matthews was called out by name, right, tonight. Um, I know Diane Matthews as the person who mobilized the homeless in our community. Uh, to come to city council meetings to advocate for themselves that they actually needed some of these resources and a homelessness task force. That was uh, above and beyond the call of duty for Officer Matthews there. So I think she needs to be commended for it. Also, like uh, Officer Matthews saved somebody's life a few months ago uh, when they were held at knife point. And that's not something we necessarily send a press release out about. Uh, but maybe we should in the future, you know. So uh, I think it goes both ways. Um, overall, I, th I think this is the beginning of a good conversation. Um, I, I absolutely believe in getting people more plugged into the department. I think it was a shame, you know, with uh, budgetary restrictions that we suspended the copy with cop program, um, you know, which, which gave an opportunity for people in the community to interact with frontline officers, you know, not just the head of the department and everything. So I'd love to bring that back. I'd love to plug people in for ride-alongs, um, again, just so people have all the information they need to make an intelligent decision on this, and this can be a, a good public discourse that we have, um, and not just a back and forth. I think everybody has good intentions on this, um, so let's just work together to look at the best outcome there, and uh, 
I guess a typical politician, you ask more questions and you have positions there to <laughs> get out of uh, stating one, but that, that's all I have for now. It's uh, 1040 at night. Thanks very much. Thank you. Quickly, just Connor, ahead, just for, for just general, um, we didn't actually end the coffee with a cop for budgetary reasons. It was because of COVID and the ability to and actually, the coffee shops were closed for a while uh, and being distanced. So it is something to think about. Um, similarly, um, under just getting facts out there, um, make sure people understand that the cemetery is not hierarchically underneath the city of Montpelier's jurisdiction. Um, it's, they're not really our domain. Um, but anyway, um, any other thoughts? Um, so at this point, um, one of the things that we could do is uh, move, sorry, I'm, I'm like losing my words, it's starting to get late. Um, actually, before I do that, Jay, do you want to jump in? If, you, if not, it's okay, but I just want to make sure I, okay, all right. Um, so uh, one of the things that we could do is uh, authorize uh, the city manager to start implementing the action plan um, as laid out uh, by the uh, chief's uh, report. Uh, that does not necessarily preclude ex uh, exploring other things moving on into the future, um, but uh, I'm certainly interested in at least starting to move forward, including uh, forming the strategic uh, advisory uh strategic planning advisory board um not sure how just looking at the timeline that that you had posted there chief um it looked like it looked like it was going to be for next year um what lauren was saying sounded like you know you were hoping for it to be sooner um you know i'm all certainly open to you know whatever whatever people think works uh but um uh, having said all that is there a motion. Uh, well, I'll make a motion on the, I think what the easier of the two, and, and it might make sense to bifurcate it. Uh, I'll make a motion to uh, direct the city manager and the to direct the, the chief to implement the uh, recommendations of the chief's report um, for strategic planning. Just for strategic, just right. Sorry. Think, that's, uh, it, yeah. That they're using strategic yeah. playing as a uh, okay. umbrella for the so, uh, strategic goal implementation. Okay. Thank you. Is there a second? Okay. Um, there's a second. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, Jack. When I heard you say that, uh, the question occurred to me that uh, I'm going to raise, which is, does the chief require a direction, a mandate from the council to move forward, or is this something that's inherently within his authority as the uh, Montpelier chief of police, which is what that's I would- That's a good thought. question. So well, I'll, I'll, wait, I'll weigh in on this. Um, you know, the chief obviously has administrative authority over the police department. I have administrative authority over all departments, including the police department. Um, given all the discussion, the chief's laid out a vision, which is a policy vision for the future of the community. I think a vote of support for that uh, establishes that this is sort of where the council is at for now. I mean, not precluding anything else. But moving forward, it doesn't mean that every single that you've approved tacitly every item on that list, if there's no budget funds for it or anything like that, but it says we, we've seen the plan, we're behind you to go forward and do that. So um, yeah, you know, Chief and I could probably do it all on our own, but I think it's better uh, done in the open with in support of people, particularly given all the all the issues that have been raised. And, uh, And having said that, I actually want to weigh in. This is this is government nerd 101. While I'm while I've got the mic, um, just to be clear, you know, we talked about 
the council is the citizens oversight board and, and, and that is true. But you remember our former government actually, you have one employee who is your, your oversight for all city departments and that's me. Um, so it is my job to provide that oversight to every department, professional oversight and report to you. And if you are not happy with that, then obviously you take that up with me and, and do that. So your role is overseeing a full-time professional person who's uh, who's doing that. So there, there is, that's very clear in our charter and statute how that works. And so any other structure we create would have to sort of work within that, I think, to be consistent with the law. Toss that out there, but that's digress from the motion that's at hand. Okay, from there I saw Donna, Dan, and Lauren. Well, I support seeing this as a vision because it is a strategic plan. And so moving forward, and I see Bill, you as his boss and us as yours, but we also normally, the council appoints committees. And, and that's not clear here who appoints this committee, this group. And so I might want to insert that the city council appoints members of this committee. I think that was our, our expectation. Okay. Okay. I misread it then. Okay. Right. And, 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 I, oh, sorry. Great. And and you were let's... basically saying, let's go ahead and start that process. Yep. Yep. Okay. Good. Great. Uh, go ahead, Dan. Yeah. No, I, I, I just share with that. I mean, I, I think it's important that as, you know, one of our functions as city council is to express um, our, our direction on policy. Um, so I see this really as a policy. Uh, vision, and so I think it's proper for us to to vote on it. In addition to what what Bill described, and I I I, I think the second thing that we should take up, and why I didn't want and and I didn't want to shoehorn it into this particular motion is, you know, if we want to talk about any type of, of advisory committee um, or strategic planning committee, whatever we would necessarily call it, I, I think that actually would require a, its own and I hate to say this, a, a committee to decide on the committee, um, but but it should be, I mean, it's it's almost like the parking, the um, the options that we're gonna discuss for meeting in person, which is, I think there has to be some, some options to make sure that we're acting consistent with our structured and form of government, uh, as well as what's gonna be most effective in, in facilitating what we've started here with both the policy and the conversation. Um, Lauren, and then Donna again. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess I'm, I think like voting to, you know, affirm this vision, even though in my mind, I think it raises a lot of like discussions that the community needs to have. So I just hope it's like clear that this is this like voting to affirm this is affirming processes that will continue discussions and there are things in this report that I could see a committee and the council maybe going in a different direction than what's in the report so I don't want it to be viewed as like uh, that you know like speaking for myself like my vote for it which I will do but I also am very interested in you know there, there might be things where we land differently and like specific pieces of it and so just to be clear on where I'm coming from. And I do think it bears more conversation, not tonight, um, <laughs> of you know, knowing that the the committees we create, like being really thoughtful about what the charge is and what the so that there's, you know, we've had instances before of like lack of clarity of what exactly is is are the goals and the mission of a specific group and who are who what's the right membership and all of that. So I think um, the idea that we could you know, work with city staff maybe to come up with a list of ideas on and with the chief and um you know who what's a good membership but what's a good charge of this group um and I, I i do think we need this committee to think about the longer term kind of citizen oversight committee because i think there's a lot of ideas there's a lot of different ways to structure that so i hate to say a committee for a committee to create a committee but i, I think in this case it actually <laughs> we, that could be part of the, this initial charge and then that this group could go away and a different like longer term entity could be um take its place but okay thank you uh go ahead bill oh, and then I'm sorry, sorry. And then Donna. No, I Donna, go ahead. Yeah. maybe bill's gonna say I mean, we treat it the same way we treated the homeless task force 
I mean, we ask staff to come and Bill can work with his staff and come with a recommendation of duties, roles, charge for that committee. And then we advertise for members. I think it's just, it becomes a standard committee with the different charge, you know? So, yeah, I think the only difference would be probably you'd want to approve all that before we advertise to make sure it said exactly what you yeah. wanted to say. But I don't think you need to make a committee to form a committee. I think we can, no. we've heard what you had to say. We've heard what the residents have to say. Um, you know, I think we have some thoughts about the role and we'll lay out what, what we're recommending and then you can, you and the public will fix it or amend it however you see fit and then we'll. Go ahead, Lauren. Well, just, just to clarify, so there's, I, I don't think we need a committee to form this committee, but I think there's been an idea raised of a citizen oversight committee or some somebody who would take like complaints from the community about interactions with the police or things like that. So I think there have been ideas put forward like that, that I think a strategic visioning group um, would, or a group looking so. at policy could could look. So that's what I meant. I did not, <laughs> just just right. to be clear, like that could be one of the, the things they could look well, at. And I would think one of the charges, to that point, one of the charges would be how to have, you know, a, a longstanding transparency or, you know, some pub meaningful public input into the police department. And then that group could, way out the best way to do that and come back with a recommendation. So. Yeah, sure. Okay, any further comments? Okay, there's um, been a motion and a second. Um, so uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Okay, so the motion passes. And again, this is uh, just the beginning. So thank you again, uh, Chief, for all of your work on this. Um, and thanks to the, the department. And thank you all, you know, to the public and the council who have stuck out the meeting so far. <laughs> um, okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna move on. Thank you. Um, and I think there's at least one item that we need to take up, um, which is the street closure um, item. And then if we want to punt on the meeting in person thing, that's fine with me, but we can make that decision together. Um, so in terms of street closure. Very briefly. Turn, uh, yeah. So very briefly, you recall at a prior meeting, we approved the plan for the schools to block off Park Avenue and for the use of you know the schools for this year for their intake process inherent in that plan was the creation of two reserve parking spaces and we did this two years ago as well for the playground project for the, the property owner who is blocked by this and we actually did do an ordinance last time to create those uh, and they'll be you know we'll get them signed and everything in time for the beginning of school even though you may not have had second reading but this is just to formalize that for, you know, when we'll undo it again, like we did last time. Um, but really, um, this I think this is a must do. It's the, otherwise the whole school plan doesn't work. So. And we've done it before and it worked. So please hold for a second. Pass it. I want to make a motion to pass. <laughs> open, you, have open the, you have to open the public yeah. hearing first. Yeah, okay, right, sorry, missed that. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna officially open a public hearing on this temporary parking uh, ordinance. Is there anybody left? <laughs> With that said, would anybody like to comment? Uh, Jack. Well, I just raised a question I raised last time, which is we've, uh, We've had all the communication we need with the with the neighbors, and uh, and they're on board with this. Yes, and the and the one impacted neighbor is this individual, and you know they're, they're occupants of their building, and that was their only request: is can I, you know, can we have the parking spaces on the street like we had last time? And of course, we said, I mean, that's how it work, has to work. Otherwise, they they completely can't access their property. Yeah, with a vehicle. Great. Great. Um, other comments? Cameron, we don't have anybody? Just to check? Okay. All right, Donna, go ahead. I make that motion <laughs> to approve the temporary parking ordinance as stated in the August 18th memo. Second. second. Oh. Okay, motion is second. Any further discussion? 
Okay, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so the motion passes. I'm going to close the public hearing. And uh, Bill, is this this is one that we need to have a second reading on? Um, we have to. We, do, we traditionally do. Our ordinance, the charter really only says we have to have one. We just always do have two. It's up to you. We just voted to pass it. I think, it, personally, I think it's a temporary thing. I don't think you need two readings. So. Agreed. I think that's probably fair. Yeah. Um, okay. Great. Um, how are y'all feeling? Do you want to put off the meeting in person discussion, or do you, would you like to have that discussion this evening? I, I'm all for like just saying I'll, I'll put it off. We'll have that conversation next time. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. You know, this is something where I think it would be useful. I know people get the uh, agendas on the uh, city's webpage and the, and Facebook page and stuff like that. It might be useful to do a special thing uh, out to the public saying, hey, the city council is looking at uh, going back to in-person meetings. Let us know what you think about it because there's still a whole lot of uh, strong feelings on both sides about being in person with other people and uh, and I just want to get it out there to the public in a way that they don't miss that uh, we're talking about it. Seems like a good call. Yeah. That's something that we can put out on like the Facebook page or something. Awesome. Yeah. Thank Bring you, Cameron. All the detail you shared with us, the pros and cons. Yeah. Hey, well, it, it would be up to y'all if you'd like me to like if you just want opinions, if you want to hear, I mean, I think um, y'all's pros and cons are a little different because if you choose to come in and sit for council, people can still choose to come or not, you know, the same way they did before where y'all would have less of a choice. So it's more maybe an opinion based thing, but I'll, you know, whatever information. Um, thinking about Moving on here, we actually did not yet do the COVID update. Um, it is a written report, so we could read it, Cameron? Yeah. <laughs> I guess one question I, know. I have in general is, you know, we haven't had as much changing. Do, do you want to continue having, I mean, obviously we'll keep the written updates. Do you want to continue having this on the agenda or only if there's news to report? Yes. I, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I think when there's time, it's it's a helpful part of the meeting, uh, but it's something I think we can take under advisement tonight. <laughs> well, when there's some major change, I think that we need to talk about it. Or tonight, though, we're going to skip it then. That's sort of what I'm hearing. And I'm assuming that we've read it, unless there's any big highlights that you think are worth pointing out, Cameron. I have one. I mean, if folks want to watch this again, um, or if they're watching now, um, the governor um, will the press conference, a couple um, DMVs will be reopening, um, including the one in Montpelier for in-person appointments. So that I think changes a lot for our residents here. Um, so that will be opening. It opened, uh, I'm sorry, it will be opening tomorrow. Um, and appointments can be made online or if you give them a call. They'll also be opening in South Burlington and Rutland. And then um, the Department of Agriculture and Working Lands Assistance have put out some grants. They have 8.5 million available for farmers. Um, uh, they listed a whole bunch of different types of farms that qualify, but I think most um, you know, farmers qualify for that. So there is a, quite a bit of money out there for folks if they need it for income like um, relief. Um, we do have, uh, uh, Morgan is here with his hand raised. Um, that that Morgan, really includes my updates, so. Okay, thank you. Um, Morgan, we are about to jump into council reports, but did you have something really quick you want to share? Yes. Um, just going back to the previous conversation about uh, meeting in person. As far as like posting 
I would also recommend uh, front porch forum. Not everybody is on Facebook. Fair enough. You gotta, you gotta remember about that. So keep that in mind. So front porch forum is actually uh, a real good means to keep in mind. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Um, council reports. All right, we're gonna start with Donna. Okay. I don't want to meet in person yet, but along those lines, I do feel a need for us to have some intentional social time as counselors without the public, whether we come early with our sandwiches or we stay late with a liquid toss. Um, I would like us to really try to have some intentional social time together. Um, so please think about that for next week. Okay, thank you. Connor. It's just not the same without Donna kicking me under the desk if I say something stupid. So yeah, I do miss the in-person meetings, but uh, I'll, I'll pass. Otherwise, thanks. Okay. Jay. Uh, okay, a couple things. One, um, on a personal note and, and along the themes of, of our uh, a lot of our conversation tonight around the good work that our uh, city does for us and the support uh, they provide for us. Um, uh, two nights ago, uh, two of my boys were out. Um, uh, on a bike ride after dinner and one of them my 12 year old uh, tried to decide that it was a good idea to ride down a couple steps and took a, a really bad fall um went over the handlebars um and uh br broke his arm pretty bad but i just wanted to 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 call out a couple things one is the uh, the neighbor, uh, who I have no idea who they are, they, I saw them walking away as I, I got there, who called 911, um, which is uh, really important. Um, and then I also wanted to specifically call out the uh, paramedics and firefighters who uh, showed up, um, uh, Lieutenant uh, Jasmine, Firefighter Redman, and Firefighter and par uh, Paramedic Peterson, who uh, were professional and calm and stabilized um, uh, uh, my son and got him to the hospital. Um, and uh, I just uh, made a pretty traumatic experience, all manageable, all things considered. So I just wanted to call them out specifically and thank them for, for their service and, and all they did. Um, and then the other, the other piece on, uh, I guess, continue on some, somewhat of a somber note, um, is I do think that uh, you know, being the, the council rep on the Montpelier Live Board and, and being in communication with MDC, um, I, ju I just think it's important to acknowledge the ongoing and continued struggles that our downtown businesses are having um, and that the pandemic is, you know, conti continuing to have the, you know, long-term consequences. And I think we, um, two things. One is we, we need to be prepared to, um, for a lot of uh, downtown vacancies and empty storefronts showing up, um, particularly from businesses who have, who have been around for a long time, who uh, may not be able to stick it out and make it through. And, and also, um, I think we need to, as a council, not that there's any action to do tonight, but be thinking about steps, proactive steps that we might be able to, to take as a city to provide some support um, because so much of the downtown vibrancy and local businesses you know, is built on momentum and a, and a, and a strong sense of place um, and economic vitality. And the more empty storefronts we see, the, the bigger of a challenge it's going to be for us to, um, to, to uh, you know, to, to outlast that and outlast the, the, the pandemic. So I just wanted to um, uh, bring that to everybody's attention. That's it. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Dan. Um, two things real quick. One, to build on on what Jay is saying, because I, I share those concerns um, and have had a lot of similar conversations, is we may want to think about, um, you know, larger than, than the retail and the business, but how we plan for the next year. Um, I, had, I was working with an out-of-state council who advises uh, a lot of hotel businesses, uh, large corporations, um, and she said that they are thinking about a return to normalcy in 2023. Um, and so, you know, we may, as a city council, want to have 
um, some type of uh, process or committee or you know task force, whatever we call it, that is looking at deeply at at how we're going to survive um, going forward. If and as they're anticipating, you know, normal doesn't necessarily snap back into place. And if we do have a fall where we do have these things happen and businesses that are enjoying somewhat of a reprieve by putting things outside now have to go back inside to limited capacity. Um, the second thing that I'll, I'll, uh, I'll say is that, you know, I really appreciate this council uh, and the staff, um, Chief and, and Bill, um, for helping us do a very democratic process through a lot of difficult conversations. And I enjoy serving with all of you on this council. And I think it's really important that, you know, as someone pointed out, we went from, I think, one extreme to the other um, in a matter of a few hours. And it's really a testament to how we conduct ourselves as a civil board um, in a civil society to have these conversations where people can speak out and can express these very strong opinions um, and are heard. Um, you know, whether whether we follow through or agree, that's another thing altogether. But the fact is, is that I, I, I'm very glad to be part of a board that's as welcoming as ours. So that's all. Great, thank you. Uh, Jack. Thank you. I'll just briefly mention something that Don is usually the person to mention on this uh, council, and that is that I had a, a, a meeting the other day with uh, with Kim Cheney, who is the board chair or president of the uh, Central Vermont Public Safety Authority, and Montpelier is entitled to appoint two members to that board, and we've advertised a couple of times for uh, volunteers to do that, and we haven't gotten uh, Montpelier residents uh, to do it, and uh, I I do think it's something that uh, deserves some of our attention. And I'm not sure. I'm not saying that we should put it on our agenda at the next meeting and ask Kim Chin to come talk to us again because he has done that more than once. But I do think that uh, it's something that. There are opportunities for uh, this body, which is a regional municipality, to uh, improve the uh, public safety of the region by uh, uh, rationalizing uh, public safety dispatch. And uh, I think there are likely to be some resources uh, available to to move forward on some some ideas with uh, with COVID money and so it, it deserves more attention than I've given it and uh, I think we should be thinking about what we can do and that's all I've got. Fair enough. Uh, all right, Lauren. Um, I would just really briefly echo what Dan said. I just have been sitting here really appreciative, both for our very engaged community and having, um, you know, staff, the chief and counselors that are really thoughtful, open-minded and, you know, really bringing, I think, strong values um, and trying to reflect our community. So appreciate working with you all through these really challenging and important issues. That's all. Um, I am going to pass and all right on to John Odom, City Clerk. Hey, you caught me off guard there. I didn't know you were going to pass. <laughs> um, Surprise. I've yeah, been doing this with my hair sticking up. Uh, all I would say is please, please, at least one more person go and sign my uh, liquor licenses that are waiting over there because I'm a little worried about a couple of our struggling businesses suddenly not being able to sell alcohol next week. I am also concerned about my own vacation, which starts next week. So if you all can uh, get around to that. Other than that, I guess I should mention that we're going into the vote by mail election here. So everybody in town is going to be sent a ballot, whether you ask for it or not, um, at the end of the month. So 
Uh, I'll have a little more details on how that'll work uh, soon for next time. Great. Bill. I'm going to pass. I'll, I'll spare you all whatever, whatever we had to say, we'll put it in a memo. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, okay. Again, thanks for hanging in there, everybody. Um, sorry that it is so late, um, but there we are. All right. So without um, objection, I'm going to declare being adjourned. Have a good evening, everybody. 11 on 9. All right. Bye, folks. Woo! 11 on 9. You have time, Jack, to get home and catch the end of the RNC. Uh, not one minute. <laughs>